Thank you for listening to our audiobooks. We do our best to regularly upload quality books with clear narrations. Please subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell icon so we can bring you more great books. Thank you very much and enjoy your audiobook. Alan Quatermain by H. Ryder Haggard Chapter 11 The Frowning City For an hour or more I sat waiting. Umslopogaas having meanwhile gone to sleep also, till at length the east turned grey, and huge misty shapes moved over the surface of the water like ghosts of long-forgotten dawns. They were the vapours rising from their watery bed to greet the sun. Then the grey turned to primrose, and the primrose grew to red. Next glorious bars of light sprang up across the eastern sky, and through them the radiant messengers of the dawn came speeding upon their arrowy way, scattering the ghostly vapors and awakening the mountains with a kiss as they flew from range to range and longitude to longitude. Another moment and the golden gates were open and the sun himself came forth as a bridegroom from his chamber, with pomp and glory and a flashing as of ten million spears, and embraced the night and covered her with brightness, and it was day. But as yet I could see nothing save the beautiful blue sky above, for over the water was a thick layer of mist exactly as though the whole surface had been covered with billows of cotton wool, by degrees, however, the sun sucked up the mists, and then I saw that we were afloat upon a glorious sheet of blue water of which I could not make out the shore. Some eight or ten miles behind us, however, there stretched as far as the eye could reach a range of precipitous hills that formed a retaining wall of the lake, and I have no doubt but that it was through some entrance in these hills that the subterranean river found its way into the open water. Indeed, I afterwards ascertained this to be the fact, and it will be some indication of the extraordinary strength and directness of the current of the mysterious river that the canoe, even at this distance, was still answering to it. Presently, too, I or rather Umslopogaas, who woke up just then, discovered another indication, and a very unpleasant one it was. Perceiving some whitish object upon the water, Umslopogaas called my attention to it, and with a few strokes of the paddle brought the canoe to the spot, whereupon we discovered that the object was the body of a man floating face downwards. This was bad enough, but imagine my horror when Umslopogaas, having turned him on to his back with the paddle, we recognized in the sunken features the lineaments of, whom do you suppose, none other than our poor servant, who had been sucked down two days before in the waters of the subterranean river. It quite frightened me. I thought that we had left him behind forever, and behold, borne by the current, he had made the awful journey with us, and with us had reached the end. His appearance also was dreadful, for he bore traces of having touched the pillar of fire, one arm being completely shriveled up, and all his hair being burnt off. The features were, as I have said, sunken, and yet they preserved upon them that awful look of despair that I had seen upon his living face as the poor fellow was sucked down. Really the sight unnerved me, weary and shaken as I felt with all that we had gone through, and I was heartily glad when suddenly and without any warning the body began to sink just as though it had had a mission, which having been accomplished it retired, the real reason no doubt being that turning it on its back allowed a free passage to the gas. Down it went to the transparent depths, fathom after fathom, we could trace its course, till at last a long line of bright air bubbles, swiftly chasing each other to the surface, 
alone remained where it had passed. At length these two were gone, and that was an end of our poor servant. Umslopogaas thoughtfully watched the body vanish. "'What did he follow us for?' he asked. "'Tis an ill omen for thee and me, Macumazahn." And he laughed. I turned on him angrily, for I dislike these unpleasant suggestions. If people have such ideas, they ought in common decency to keep them to themselves. I detest individuals who make on the subject of their disagreeable presentiments, or who, when they dream that they saw one hanged as a common felon, or some such horror, will insist upon telling one all about it at breakfast, even if they have to get up early to do it. Just then, however, the others woke up and began to rejoice exceedingly at finding that we were out of that dreadful river and once more beneath the blue sky. Then followed a babble of talk and suggestions as to what we were to do next, the upshot of all of which was that, as we were excessively hungry and had nothing whatsoever left to eat except a few scraps of biltong, dried game flesh, having abandoned all that remained of our provisions to those horrible freshwater crabs, we determined to make for the shore. But a new difficulty arose. We did not know where the shore was, and with the exception of the cliffs through which the subterranean river made its entry, could see nothing but a wide expanse of sparkling blue water. Observing, however, that the long flights of aquatic birds kept flying from our left, we concluded that they were advancing from their feeding grounds on shore to pass the day in the lake, and accordingly headed the boat towards the quarter whence they came, and began to paddle. Before long, however, a stiffish breeze sprang up, blowing directly in the direction we wanted. So we improvised a sail with a blanket and the pole, which took us along merrily. This done, we devoured the remnants of our biltong, washed down with the sweet lake water, and then lit our pipes and awaited whatever might turn up. When we had been sailing for an hour, Good, who was searching the horizon with the spyglass, suddenly announced joyfully that he saw land, and pointed out that, from the change in the color of the water, he thought we must be approaching the mouth of a river. In another minute we perceived a great golden dome, not unlike that of St. Paul's, piercing the morning mists, and while we were wondering what in the world it could be, Good reported another and still more important discovery, namely that a small sailing boat was advancing towards us. This bit of news which we were very shortly able to verify with our own eyes, threw us into a considerable flutter. That the natives of this unknown lake should understand the art of sailing seemed to suggest that they possessed some degree of civilization. In a few more minutes, it became evident that the occupant or occupants of the advancing boat had made us out. For a moment or two, she hung in the wind as though in doubt, and then came tacking towards us with great swiftness. In ten more minutes she was within a hundred yards, and we saw that she was a neat little boat, not a canoe dugout, but built more or less in the European fashion, with planks, and carrying a singularly large sail for her size. But our attention was soon diverted from the boat to her crew which consisted of a man and a woman nearly as white as ourselves. We stared at each other in amazement, thinking that we must be mistaken, but no, there was no doubt about it. They were not fair, but the two people in the boat were decidedly of a white as distinguished from a black race, as white, for instance, as Spaniards or Italians. It was a patent fact so it was true, after all, and mysteriously led by a power beyond our own, we had discovered this wonderful people. 
I could have shouted for joy when I thought of the glory and the wonder of the thing. And as it was, we all shook hands and congratulated each other on the unexpected success of our wild search. All my life had I heard rumors of a white race that existed in the highlands of this vast continent, and longed to put them to the proof, and now here I saw it with my own eyes and was dumbfounded. Truly, as Sir Henry said, the old Roman was right when he wrote Ex Africa Semper Aliquid Novi, which he tells me means that out of Africa there always comes some new thing. The man in the boat was of a good but not particularly fine physique and possessed straight black hair, regular aquiline features, and an intelligent face. He was dressed in a brown cloth garment, something like a flannel shirt without the sleeves, and in an unmistakable kilt of the same material. The legs and feet were bare. Round the right arm and left leg he wore thick rings of yellow metal that I judged to be gold. The woman had a sweet face, wild and shy, with large eyes and curling brown hair. Her dress was made of the same material as the man's, and consisted, as we afterwards discovered, first of a linen undergarment that hung down to her knee, and then of a single long strip of cloth about four feet wide by fifteen long, which was wound round the body in graceful folds, and finally flung over the left shoulder, so that the end, which was dyed blue, or purple, or some other color, according to the social standing of the wearer, hung down in front, the right arm and breast being, however, left quite bare. A more becoming dress, especially when, as in the present case, the wearer was young and pretty, it is quite impossible to conceive. Good, who has an eye for such things, was greatly struck with it, and so indeed was I. It was so simple and yet so effective. Meanwhile, if we had been astonished at the appearance of the man and woman, it was clear that they were far more astonished at us. As for the man, he appeared to be overcome with fear and wonder, and for a while hovered round our canoe but would not approach. At last, however, he came within hailing distance and called to us in a language that sounded soft and pleasing enough, but of which we could not understand one word. So we hailed back in English, French, Latin, Greek, German, Zulu, Dutch, Sisutu, Kukuana, and a few other native dialects that I am acquainted with. But our visitor did not understand any of these tongues. Indeed, they appeared to bewilder him. As for the lady, she was busily employed in taking stock of us, and Good was returning the compliment by staring at her hard through his eyeglass, a proceeding that she seemed rather to enjoy than otherwise. At length, the man, being unable to make anything of us, suddenly turned his boat round and began to head off for the shore, his little boat skimming away before the wind like a swallow. As she passed across our bows, the man turned to attend to the large sail, and Good promptly took the opportunity to kiss his hand to the young lady. I was horrified at this proceeding, both on general grounds and because I feared that she might take offense, but to my delight she did not, for first glancing round and seeing that her husband or brother or whoever he was was engaged, she promptly kissed hers back. Ah, said I, it seems that we have at last found a language that the people of this country understand. In which case, said Sir Henry, good will prove an invaluable interpreter. I frowned, for I do not approve of good's frivolities, and he knows it, and I turn the conversation to more serious subjects. It is very clear to me, I said, that the man will be back before long with a host of his fellows. So we had best make up our minds as to how we are going to receive them. 
The question is how will they receive us, said Sir Henry. As for good, he made no remark, but began to extract a small square tin case that had accompanied us in all our wanderings from under a pile of baggage. Now we had often remonstrated with good about this tin case, inasmuch as it had been an awkward thing to carry, and he had never given any very explicit account as to its contents. But he had insisted on keeping it, saying mysteriously that it might come in very useful one day. "'What on earth are you going to do, Good?' asked Sir Henry. "'Do? Why, dress, of course. You don't expect me to appear in a new country in these things, do you?' and he pointed to his soiled and worn garments, which were, however, like all goods things, very tidy, and with every tear neatly mended. We said no more, but watched his proceedings with breathless interest. His first step was to get Alphonse, who was thoroughly competent in such matters, to trim his hair and beard in the most approved fashion. I think that if he had had some hot water and a cake of soap at hand, he would have shaved off the latter, but he had not. This done, he suggested that we should lower the sail of the canoe and all take a bath, which we did, greatly to the horror and astonishment of Alphonse, who lifted his hands and ejaculated that these English were indeed a wonderful people. Umslopogas who, though he was, like most high-bred Zulus, scrupulously clean in his person, did not see the fun of swimming about in a lake, also regarded the proceeding with mild amusement. We got back into the canoe much refreshed by the cold water, and sat to dry in the sun, whilst Good undid his tin box, and produced first a beautiful clean white shirt, just as it had left a London steam laundry, and then some garments wrapped first in brown, then in white, and finally in silver paper. We watched this undoing with the tenderest interest and much speculation. One by one, Good removed the dull husks that hid their splendors, carefully folding and replacing each piece of paper as he did so. And there, at last, lay in all the majesty of its golden epaulets, lace, and buttons, a commander of the Royal Navy's full-dress uniform, dress sword, cocked hat, shiny patent leather boots, and all. We literally gasped. What? we said. What? Are you going to put those things on? Certainly, he answered composedly. You see, so much depends upon a first impression, especially, he added, as I observe that there are ladies about. One, at least of us, ought to be decently dressed. We said no more. We were simply dumbfounded, especially when we considered the artful way in which Good had concealed the contents of that box for all these months. Only one suggestion did we make namely, that he should wear his mail shirt next his skin. He replied that he feared it would spoil the set of his coat, now carefully spread in the sun, to take the creases out, but finally consented to this precautionary measure. The most amusing part of the affair, however, was to see old Umslopogas's astonishment and Alphonse's delight at Good's transformation. When at last he stood up in all his glory, even down to the medals on his breast, and contemplated himself in the still waters of the lake, after the fashion of the young gentleman in ancient history, whose name I cannot remember, but who fell in love with his own shadow, the old Zulu could no longer restrain his feelings. Oh, Bougwan, he said, oh, Bougwan, I always thought thee an ugly little man and fat, fat as the cows at calving time. And now thou art like a blue jay when he spreads his tail out. Surely, Bougwan, it hurts my eyes to look at thee. Good did not 
much like this allusion to his fat, which, to tell the truth, was not very well deserved, for hard exercise had brought him down three inches. But on the whole he was quite pleased at Umslopogaas's admiration. As for Alphonse, he was quite delighted. Ah, but monsieur has the beautiful air, the air of the warrior. It is the ladies who will say so when we come to get ashore. Monsieur is complete. He puts me in mind of my heroic grand... Here we stopped, Alphonse. As we gazed upon the beauties thus revealed by good, a spirit of emulation filled our breasts, and we set to work to get ourselves up as well as we could. The most, however, that we were able to do was to array ourselves in our spare suits of shooting clothes, of which we each had several. All the fine clothes in the world could never make it otherwise than scrubby and insignificant. But Sir Henry looked what he is, a magnificent man in his nearly new tweed suit, gaiters, and boots. Alphonse also got himself up to kill, giving an extra turn to his enormous mustaches. Even old Umslopogas, who was not in a general way given to the vain adorning of his body, took some oil out of the lantern and a bit of tow, and polished up his head-ring with it till it shone like Good's patent leather boots. Then he put on the mail shirt Sir Henry had given him, and his muka, and having cleaned up Inkosikas a little, stood forth complete. All this while, having hoisted the sail again as soon as we had finished bathing, we had been progressing steadily for the land, or rather, for the mouth of a great river. Presently, in all about an hour and a half after the little boat had left us, we saw emerging from the river or harbor a large number of boats, ranging up to ten or twelve tons burden. One of these was propelled by twenty-four oars, and most of the rest sailed. Looking through the glass, we soon made out that the rowboat was an official vessel, her crew being all dressed in a sort of uniform, whilst on the half-deck forward stood an old man of venerable appearance and with a flowing white beard and a sword strapped to his side, who was evidently the commander of the craft. The other boats were apparently occupied by people brought out by curiosity, and were rowing or sailing towards us as quickly as they could. "'Now for it,' said I. "'What is the betting? Are they going to be friendly, or to put an end to us?' Nobody could answer this question, and not liking the warlike appearance of the old gentleman and his sword, we felt a little anxious. Just then Good spied a school of hippopotami on the water about two hundred yards off us, and suggested that it would not be a bad plan to impress the natives with a sense of our power by shooting some of them if possible. This, unluckily enough, struck us as a good idea, and accordingly we at once got out our eight-bore rifles, for which we still had a few cartridges left, and prepared for action. There were four of the animals, a big bull, a cow, and two young ones, one three parts grown. We got up to them without difficulty, the great animals contenting themselves with sinking down into the water and rising again a few yards farther on. Indeed, their excessive tameness struck me as being peculiar. When the advancing boats were about five hundred yards away, Sir Henry opened the ball by firing at the three parts grown young one. The heavy bullet struck it fair between the eyes, and crashing through the skull killed it, and it sank, leaving a long train of blood behind it. At the same moment I fired at the cow, and good at the old bull. My shot took effect, but not fatally and down went the hippopotamus with a prodigious splashing, only to rise again, presently blowing and grunting furiously, dyeing all the water round her crimson, 
when I killed her with the left barrel. Good, who was an execrable shot, missed the head of the bull altogether, the bullet merely cutting the side of his face as it passed. On glancing up, after I had fired my second shot, I perceived that the people we had fallen among were evidently ignorant of the nature of firearms, for the consternation caused by our shots and their effect upon the animals was prodigious. Some of the parties in the boats began to cry out in fear. Others turned and made off as hard as they could, and even the old gentleman with the sword looked greatly puzzled and alarmed, and halted his big rowboat. We had, however, but little time for observation, for just then the old bull, rendered furious by the wound he had received, rose fair within forty yards of us, glaring savagely. We all fired, and hit him in various places, and down he went, badly wounded. Curiosity now began to overcome the fear of the onlookers, and some of them sailed on up close to us, amongst these being the man and the woman whom we had first seen a couple of hours or so before, who drew up almost alongside. Just then the great brute rose again within ten yards of their base, and instantly with a roar of fury made at it open mouth. The woman shrieked, and the man tried to give the boat way, but without success. In another second I saw the huge red jaws and gleaming ivories close with a crunch on the frail craft, taking an enormous mouthful out of its side and capsizing it. Down went the boat, leaving its occupants struggling in the water. Next moment, before we could do anything towards saving them, the huge and furious creature was up again and making open mouth at the poor girl who was struggling in the water. Lifting my rifle just as the grinding jaws were about to close on her, I fired over her head right down the hippopotamus's throat. Over he went, and commenced turning round and round, snorting and blowing red streams of blood through his nostrils. Before he could recover himself, however, I let him have the other barrel in the side of the throat, and that finished him. He never moved or struggled again, but instantly sank. Our next effort was directed towards saving the girl, the man having swum off towards another boat, and in this we were fortunately successful, pulling her into the canoe amidst the shouts of the spectators, considerably exhausted and frightened, but otherwise unhurt. Meanwhile the boats had gathered together at a distance, and we could see that the occupants, who were evidently much frightened, were consulting what to do. Without giving them time for further consideration, which we thought might result unfavorably to ourselves, we instantly took our paddles and advanced toward them, Good standing in the bow and taking off his cocked hat politely in every direction his amiable features suffused by a bland but intelligent smile. Most of the craft retreated as we advanced, but a few held their ground, while the big rowboat came on to meet us. Presently we were alongside, and I could see that our appearance, and especially goods and umslopogases, filled the venerable-looking commander with astonishment not unmixed with awe. He was dressed after the same fashion as the man we first met, except that his shirt was not made of brown cloth, but of pure white linen hemmed with purple. The kilt, however, was identical, and so were the thick rings of gold around the arm and beneath the left knee. The rowers wore only a kilt, their bodies being naked to the waist. Good took off his hat to the old gentleman with an extra flourish, and inquired after his health in the purest English, to which he replied by laying the first two fingers of his right hand horizontally across his lips, 
and holding them there for a moment, which we took as his method of salutation. Then he also addressed some remarks to us, in the same soft accents that had distinguished our first interviewer, which we were forced to indicate we did not understand by shaking our heads and shrugging our shoulders. This last Alphonse, being to the manner born, did to perfection, and in so polite a way that nobody could take any offense. Then we came to a standstill, till I, being exceedingly hungry, thought I might as well call attention to the fact, and did so first by opening my mouth and pointing down it, then by rubbing my stomach. These signals the old gentleman clearly understood, for he nodded his head vigorously and pointed towards the harbor, and at the same time one of the men on his boat threw us a line and motioned to us to make it fast, which we did. The rowboat then took us in tow and went with great rapidity towards the mouth of the river, accompanied by all the other boats. In about twenty minutes more we reached the entrance to the harbor, which was crowded with boats full of people who had come out to see us. We observed that all the occupants were more and less of the same type, though some were fairer than others. Indeed, we noticed certain ladies whose skins was of a most dazzling whiteness, and the darkest shade of color which we saw was about that of a rather swarthy Spaniard. Presently the wide river gave a sweep, and when it did so an exclamation of astonishment and delight burst from our lips as we caught our first view of the place that we afterwards knew as Milosis, or the frowning city, from my, which means city, and Losis, a frown. At a distance of some five hundred yards from the river's bank rose a sheer precipice of granite, two hundred feet or so in height, which had no doubt once formed the bank itself, the intermediate space of land now utilized as docks and roadways, having been gained by draining and deepening and embanking the stream. On the brow of this precipice stood a great building of the same granite that formed the cliff, built on three sides of a square, the fourth side being open, save for a kind of battlement pierced at its base by a little door. This imposing place we afterwards discovered was the palace of the queen, or rather of the queens. At the back of the palace the town sloped gently upwards to a flashing building of white marble, crowned by the golden dome which we had already observed. The city was, with the exception of this one building, entirely built of red granite, and laid out in regular blocks with splendid roadways between. So far as we could see, also the houses were all one-storied and detached, with gardens round them, which gave some relief to the eye wearied with the vista of red granite. At the back of the palace a road of extraordinary width stretched away up the hill for a distance of a mile and a half or so, and appeared to terminate at an open space surrounding the gleaming building that crowned the hill. But right in front of us was the wonder and glory of Milosis, the great staircase of the palace, the magnificence of which took our breath away. Let the reader imagine, if he can, a splendid stairway, sixty-five feet from balustrade to balustrade, consisting of two vast flights, each of one hundred and twenty-five steps of eight inches in height by three feet broad, connected by a flat resting place sixty feet in length, and running from the palace wall on the edge of the precipice down to meet a waterway or canal cut to its foot from the river. This marvelous staircase was supported upon a single enormous granite arch, of which the resting place between the two flights formed the crown. That is, the connecting open space lay upon it. From this archway sprang a subsidiary flying arch, 
or rather something that resembled a flying arch in shape, such as none of us had seen in any other country, and of which the beauty and wonder surpassed all that we had ever imagined. Three hundred feet from point to point, and no less than five hundred and fifty round the curve, that half-arc soared, touching the bridge it supported for a space of fifty feet only, one end resting on and built into the parent archway, and the other embedded in the solid granite of the side of the precipice. This staircase, with its supports, was, indeed, a work of which any living man might have been proud, both on account of its magnitude and its surpassing beauty. Four times, as we afterwards learnt, did the work which was commenced in remote antiquity fail, and was then abandoned for three centuries when half finished, till at last there rose a youthful engineer named Radimas, who said that he would complete it successfully and staked his life upon it. If he failed, he was to be hurtled from the precipice he had undertaken to scale. If he succeeded, he was to be rewarded by the hand of the king's daughter. Five years was given to him to complete the work, and an unlimited supply of labor and material. Three times did his arch fall, till at last, seeing failure to be inevitable, he determined to commit suicide on the morrow of the third collapse. That night, however, a beautiful woman came to him in a dream and touched his forehead, and of a sudden he saw a vision of the completed work, and saw, too, through the masonry, and how the difficulties connected with the flying arch that had hitherto baffled his genius were to be overcome. Then he awoke, and once more commenced the work, but on a different plan. And behold, he achieved it, and on the last day of the five years, he led the princess his bride up the stair and into the palace. And in due course he became king by right of his wife, and founded the present Zuvendi dynasty, which is to this day called the House of the Stairway, thus proving once more how energy and talent are the natural stepping stones to grandeur. And to commemorate his triumph, he fashioned a statue of himself dreaming, and of the fair woman who touched him on the forehead, and placed it in the great hall of the palace, and there it stands to this day. Such was the great stair of Milosis, and such the city beyond. No wonder they named it the Frowning City, for certainly those mighty works in solid granite did seem to frown down upon our littleness in their somber splendor. This was so even in the sunshine, but when the storm clouds gathered on her imperial brow, Milosis looked more like a supernatural dwelling place, or some imagining of a poet's brain, than what she is, a mortal city carved by the patient genius of generations out of the red silence of the mountainside. Chapter 12 The Sister Queens the big rowing boat glided on up the cutting that ran almost to the foot of the vast stairway, and then halted at a flight of steps leading to the landing place. Here the old gentleman disembarked, and invited us to do so likewise, which having no alternative, and being nearly starved, we did without hesitation, taking our rifles with us, however. As each of us landed, our guide again laid his fingers on his lips and bowed deeply, at the same time ordering back the crowd which had assembled to gaze on us. The last to leave the canoe was the girl we had picked out of the water, for whom her companion was waiting. Before she went away, she kissed my hand, I suppose as a token of gratitude for having saved her from the fury of the hippopotamus and it seemed to me that she had by this time quite got over any fear she might have had of us, 
and was by no means anxious to return in such a hurry to her lawful owners. At any rate, she was going to kiss Good's hand as well as mine, when the young man interfered and led her off. As soon as we were on shore, a number of the men who had rowed the big boat took possession of our few goods and chattels, and started with them up the splendid staircase, our guide indicating to us by means of motions that the things were perfectly safe. This done, he turned to the right and led the way to a small house, which was, as I afterwards discovered, an inn. Entering into a good-sized room, we saw that a wooden table was already furnished with food, presumably in preparation for us. Here our guide motioned us to be seated on a bench that ran the length of the table. We did not require a second invitation, but at once fell to ravenously on the viands before us, which were served on wooden platters, and consisted of cold goat's flesh wrapped up in some kind of leaf that gave it a delicious flavor, green vegetables resembling lettuces, brown bread, and red wine poured from a skin into horn mugs. This wine was particularly soft and good, having something of the flavor of burgundy. Twenty minutes after we sat down at that hospitable board, we rose from it, feeling like new men. After all that we had gone through, we needed two things, food and rest, and the food of itself was a great blessing to us. Two girls of the same charming cast of face as the first, whom we had seen, waited on us while we ate, and very nicely they did it. They were also dressed in the same fashion, namely, in a white linen petticoat coming to the knee, and with the toga-like garment of brown cloth leaving bare the right arm and breast. I afterwards found out that this was the national dress, and regulated by an iron custom, though of course subject to variations. Thus, if the petticoat was pure white, it signified that the wearer was unmarried. If white, with a straight purple stripe round the edge, that she was married, and a first or legal wife. If with a black stripe, that she was a widow. In the same way, the toga, or calf, as they called it, was of different shades of color, from pure white to the deepest brown, according to the rank of the wearer, and embroidered at the end in various ways. This also applies to the shirts, or tunics, worn by the men, which varied in material and color. But the kilts were always the same, except as regards quality. One thing, however, every man and woman in the country wore as the national insignia, and that was the thick band of gold round the right arm above the elbow, and the left leg beneath the knee. People of high rank also wore a torque of gold round the neck, and I observed that our guide had one on. So soon as we had finished our meal, our venerable conductor, who had been standing all the while, regarding us with inquiring eyes, and our guns with something as like fear as his pride would allow him to show, bowed towards good, whom he evidently took for the leader of the party on account of the splendor of his apparel, and once more led the way through the door and to the foot of the great staircase. Here we paused for a moment to admire two colossal lions, each hewn from a single block of pure black marble, and standing rampant on the terminations of the wide balustrades of the staircase. These lions are magnificently executed, and it is said were sculpted by Rademas, the great prince who designed the staircase, and who was without doubt, to judge from the many beautiful examples of his art that we saw afterwards, one of the finest sculptors who ever lived, either in this or any other country. Then we climbed, almost with a feeling of awe, up that splendid stair 
a work executed for all time, and that will, I do not doubt, be admired thousands of years hence by generations unborn, unless an earthquake should throw it down. Even Umslopogaas, who as a general rule made it a point of honor not to show astonishment, which he considered undignified, was fairly startled out of himself, and asked if the bridge had been built by men or devils, which was his vague way of alluding to any supernatural power. But Alphonse did not care about it. Its solid grandeur jarred upon the frivolous little Frenchman, who said that it was all très magnifique, mais triste, ah, triste, and went on to suggest that it would be improved if the balustrades were gilt. On we went, up the first flight of 120 steps, across the broad platform joining it to the second flight, where we paused to admire the glorious view of one of the most beautiful stretches of country that the world can show, edged by the blue waters of the lake. Then we passed on up the stair, till at last we reached the top, where we found a large standing space, to which there were three entrances, all of a small size. Two of these opened on to rather narrow galleries or roadways cut in the face of the precipice that ran round the palace walls, and led to the principal thoroughfares of the city, and were used by the inhabitants passing up and down from the docks. These were defended by gates of bronze, and also, as we afterwards learnt, it was possible to let down a portion of the roadways themselves by withdrawing certain bolts, and thus render it quite impracticable for an enemy to pass. The third entrance consisted of a flight of ten curved black marble steps leading to a doorway cut in the palace wall. This wall was in itself a work of art, being built of huge blocks of granite to the height of forty feet, and so fashioned that its face was concave, whereby it was rendered practically impossible for it to be scaled. To this doorway our guide led us. The door, which was massive and made of wood protected by an outer gate of bronze, was closed. But on our approach it was thrown wide, and we were met by the challenge of a sentry, who was armed with a heavy triangular bladed spear, not unlike a bayonet in shape, and a cutting sword, and protected by breast and back plates of skillfully prepared hippopotamus hide, and a small round shield fashioned of the same tough material. The sword instantly attracted our attention. It was practically identical with the one in the possession of Mr. Mackenzie, which he had obtained from the ill-starred wanderer. There was no mistaking the gold line fretwork cut in the thickness of the blade. So the man had told the truth after all. Our guide instantly gave a password which the soldier acknowledged by letting the iron shaft of his spear fall with a ringing sound upon the pavement, and we passed on through the massive wall into the courtyard of the palace. This was about forty yards square, and laid out in flower beds full of lovely shrubs and plants, many of which were quite new to me. Through the center of this garden ran a broad walk formed of powdered shells brought from the lake in the place of gravel. Following this we came to another doorway with a round heavy arch which is hung with thick curtains. For there are no doors in the palace itself. Then came another short passage and we were in the great hall of the palace and once more stood astonished at the simple and yet overpowering grandeur of the place. The hall is, as we afterwards learnt, 150 feet long by 80 wide, and has a magnificent arched roof of carved wood. Down the entire length of the building, there are on either side, and at a distance of 20 feet from the wall, slender shafts of black marble springing sheer to the roof 
beautifully fluted, and with carved capitals. At one end of this great place which these pillars support is the group of which I have already spoken as executed by the King Rademas to commemorate his building of the staircase. And really, when we had time to admire it, its loveliness almost struck us dumb. The group, of which the figures are in white and the rest is black marble, is about half as large again as life and represents a young man of noble countenance and form sleeping heavily upon a couch. One arm is carelessly thrown over the side of this couch, and his head reposes upon the other, its curling locks partially hiding it. Bending over him, her hand resting on his forehead, is a draped female form of such white loveliness as to make the beholder's breath stand still. And as for the calm glory that shines upon her perfect face, well, I can never hope to describe it. But there it rests like the shadow of an angel's smile. And power, love, and divinity all have their part in it. Her eyes are fixed upon the sleeping youth, and perhaps the most extraordinary thing about this beautiful work is the success with which the artist has succeeded in depicting on the sleeper's worn and weary face the sudden rising of a new and spiritual thought as the spell begins to work within his mind. You can see that an inspiration is breaking in upon the darkness of the man's soul as the dawn breaks in upon the darkness of night. It is a glorious piece of statuary, and none but a genius could have conceived it. Between each of the black marble columns is some such group of figures, some allegorical, and some representing the persons and wives of deceased monarchs or great men. But none of them, in our opinion, comes up to the one I have described, although several are from the hand of the sculptor and engineer King Rademas. In the exact center of the hall, was a solid mass of black marble about the size of a baby's armchair, which it rather resembled in appearance. This, as we afterwards learnt, was the sacred stone of this remarkable people, and on it their monarchs laid their hand after the ceremony of coronation, and swore by the sun to safeguard the interests of the empire and to maintain its customs, traditions, and laws. This stone was evidently exceedingly ancient, as indeed all stones are, and was scored down its side with long marks or lines, which Sir Henry said proved it to have been a fragment that at some remote period in its history had been ground in the iron jaws of glaciers. There was a curious prophecy about this block of marble, which was reported among the people to have fallen from the sun. To the effect that when it was shattered into fragments, a king of alien race should rule over the land. As the stone, however, looked remarkably solid, the native princes seemed to have a fair chance of keeping their own for many a long year. At the end of the hall is a dais spread with rich carpets on which two thrones are set side by side. These thrones are shaped like great chairs and made of solid gold. The seats are richly cushioned, but the backs are left bare, and on each is carved the emblem of the sun, shooting out his fiery rays in all directions. The footstools are golden lions couchant, with yellow topazes set in them for eyes. There are no other gems about them. The place is lighted by numerous but narrow windows, placed high up, cut on the principle of the loopholes to be seen in ancient castles, but innocent of glass, which was evidently unknown here. Such is a brief description of this splendid hall in which we now found ourselves, compiled, of course, from our subsequent knowledge of it. On this occasion we had but little time for observation. 
for when we entered we perceived that a large number of men were gathered together in front of the two thrones, which were unoccupied. The principal among them were seated on carved wooden chairs ranged to the right and to the left of the thrones, but not in front of them, and were dressed in white tunics with various embroideries and different colored edgings, and armed with the usual pierced and gold inlaid swords. To judge from the dignity of their appearance, they seemed one and all to be individuals of very great importance. Behind each of these great men stood a small knot of followers and attendants. Seated by themselves, in a little group to the left of the throne, were six men of a different stamp. Instead of wearing the ordinary kilt, they were clothed in long robes of pure white linen, with the same symbol of the sun that is to be seen on the back of the chairs, emblazoned in gold thread upon the breast. This garment was girt up at the waist with a simple golden curb-like chain, from which hung long elliptic plates of the same metal, fashioned in shiny scales like those of a fish, that, as their wearers moved, jingled and reflected the light. They were all men of mature age, and of a severe and impressive cast of features, which was rendered still more imposing by the long beards they wore. The personality of one individual among them, however, impressed us at once. He seemed to stand out among his fellows, and refused to be overlooked. He was very old, eighty at least, and extremely tall, with a long snow-white beard that hung nearly to his waist. His features were aquiline and deeply cut, and his eyes were gray and cold-looking. The heads of the others were bare, but this man wore a round cap entirely covered with gold embroidery, from which we judged that he was a person of great importance. And indeed we afterwards discovered that he was Agon, the high priest of the country. As we approached, all these men, including the priests, rose and bowed to us with the greatest courtesy at the same time placing the two fingers across the lips in salutation. Then soft-footed attendants advanced from between the pillars, bearing seats, which were placed in a line in front of the thrones. We three sat down, Alphonse and Umslopogas standing behind us. Scarcely had we done so when there came a blare of trumpets from some passage to the right, and a similar blare from the left. Next, a man with a long white wand of ivory appeared just in front of the right-hand throne, and cried out something in a loud voice, ending with the word Nilepta, repeated three times. And another man, similarly attired, called out a similar sentence before the other throne, but ending with the word Soreus, also repeated thrice. Then came the tramp of armed men from each side entrance, and in filed about a score of picked and magnificently accoutred guards, who formed up on each side of the thrones, and let their heavy iron-handled spears fall simultaneously with a clash upon the black marble flooring. Another double blare of trumpets, and in from either side, each attended by six maidens, swept the two queens of Zuvendis, everybody in the hall rising to greet them as they came. I have seen beautiful women in my day, and am no longer thrown into transports at the sight of a pretty face, but language fails me when I try to give some idea of the blaze of loveliness that then broke upon us in the persons of these sister queens. Both were young, perhaps five and twenty years of age. Both were tall and exquisitely formed, but there the likeness stopped. One, Nilepsa, was a woman of dazzling fairness. Her right arm and bare breast, after the custom of her people, showed like snow 
even against her white and gold embroidered calf, or toga. And as for her sweet face, all I can say is that it was one that few men could look on and forget. Her hair, a veritable crown of gold, clustered in short ringlets over her shapely head, half hiding the ivory brow, beneath which eyes of deep and glorious gray flashed out in tender majesty. I cannot attempt to describe her other features, only the mouth was most sweet and curved like Cupid's bow, and over the whole countenance there shone an indescribable look of loving kindness, lit up by a shadow of delicate humor that lay upon her face like a touch of silver on a rosy cloud. She wore no jewels, but on her neck, arm, and knee were the usual torques of gold, in this instance fashioned like a snake, and her dress was of pure white linen of excessive fineness, plentifully embroidered with gold and with the familiar symbols of the sun. Her twin sister, Sereus, was of a different and darker type of beauty. Her hair was wavy, like Nelepthas, but coal-black, and fell in masses on her shoulders. Her complexion was olive, her eyes large, dark, and lustrous. The lips were full, and I thought rather cruel. Somehow her face, quiet and even cold as it is, gave an idea of passion and repose, and caused one to wonder involuntarily what its aspect would be if anything occurred to break the calm. It reminded me of the deep sea, that even on the bluest days never loses its visible stamp of power, and in its murmuring sleep is yet instinct with the spirit of the storm. Her figure, like her sister's, was almost perfect in its curves and outlines, but a trifle more rounded, and her dress was absolutely the same. As this lovely pair swept onwards to their respective thrones amid the deep attentive silence of the court, I was bound to confess to myself that they did indeed fulfill my idea of royalty. Royal they were in every way, in form, in grace, and queenly dignity, and in the barbaric splendor of their attendant pomp. But methought that they needed no guards or gold to proclaim their power and bind the loyalty of wayward men. A glance from those bright eyes, or a smile from those sweet lips, and while the red blood runs in the veins of youth, women such as these will never lack subjects, ready to do their biddings to the death. But, after all, they were women first, and queens afterwards, and therefore not devoid of curiosity. As they passed to their seats, I saw both of them glance swiftly in our direction. I saw, too, that their eyes passed by me, seeing nothing to charm them in the person of an insignificant and grizzled old man. Then they looked with evident astonishment on the grim form of old Umslopogas, who raised his axe in salutation. Attracted next by the splendor of goods apparel, for a second their glance rested on him like a humming moth upon a flower. Then off it darted to where Sir Henry Curtis stood, the sunlight from a window playing upon his yellow hair and peaked beard and marking the outlines of his massive frame against the twilight of the somewhat gloomy hall. He raised his eyes and they met the fair Nilephtha's full, and thus for the first time the goodliest man and woman that it has ever been my lot to see looked one upon another. And why it was I know not, but I saw the swift blood run up Nilephtha's skin as the pink lights run up the morning sky. Red grew her fair bosom and shapely arm, red the swan-like neck. The rounded cheeks blushed red as the petals of a rose, and then the crimson flood sank back to whence it came, and left her pale and trembling. I glanced at Sir Henry. 
he too had coloured up to the eyes. Oh, my word, thought I to myself, the ladies have come on the stage, and now we may look to the plot to develop itself. And I sighed and shook my head, knowing that the beauty of a woman is like the beauty of the lightning, a destructive thing and a cause of desolation. By the time that I had finished my reflections, both the queens were on the thrones, for all this had happened in about six seconds. Once more the unseen trumpets blared out, and then the court seated itself, and Queen Seresis motioned to us to do likewise. Next from among the crowd, whither he had withdrawn, stepped forward our guide, the old gentleman who had towed us ashore, holding by the hand the girl whom we had seen first, and afterwards rescued from the hippopotamus. Having made obeisance, he proceeded to address the queens, evidently describing to them the way and place where we had been found. It was most amusing to watch the astonishment, not unmixed with fear, reflected upon their faces as they listened to his tale. Clearly they could not understand how he had reached the lake and been found floating on it, and were inclined to attribute our presence to supernatural causes. Then the narrative proceeded, as I judged from the frequent appeals that our guide made to the girl, to the point where we had shot the hippopotami, and we at once perceived that there was something very wrong about those hippopotami, for the history was frequently interrupted by indignant exclamations from the little group of white-robed priests, and even from the courtiers, while the two queens listened with an amazed expression, especially when our guide pointed to the rifles in our hands as being the means of destruction. And here, to make matters clear, I may as well explain at once that the inhabitants of Zuvendis are sun worshippers, and that for some reason or another the hippopotamus is sacred among them. Not that they do not kill it, because at a certain season of the year they slaughter thousands, which are specially preserved in large lakes up the country, and use their hides for armor for soldiers. But this does not prevent them from considering these animals as sacred to the sun. End note. Mr. Quatermain does not seem to have been aware that it is common for animal-worshipping people to annually sacrifice the beasts they adore. See Herodotus. 245. Editor. Now, as ill luck would have it, the particular hippopotami we had shot were a family of tame animals that were kept in the mouth of the port and daily fed by priests whose special duty it was to attend to them. When we shot them, I thought that the brutes were suspiciously tame, and this was, as we afterwards ascertained, the cause of it. Thus it came about that, in attempting to show off, we had committed sacrilege of a most aggravated nature. When our guide had finished his tale, the old man with the long beard and round cap, whose appearance I have already described, and who was, as I have said, the high priest of the country, and known by the name of Agon, rose and commenced an impassioned harangue. I did not like the look of his cold gray eye as he fixed it on us. I should have liked it still less had I known that in the name of the outraged majesty of his God he was demanding that the whole lot of us should be offered up as a sacrifice by means of being burnt alive. After he had finished speaking, the Queen Soraeus addressed him in a soft and musical voice and appeared to judge from his gestures of dissent to be putting the other side of the question before him. Then Nilepha spoke in liquid accents. Little did we know that she was pleading for our lives. Finally, she turned and addressed a tall, soldier-like man of middle age with a black beard and a long, plain sword, whose name, as we afterwards learnt, was Nasta, and who was the greatest lord in the country, apparently appealing to him for support. 
Now, when Sir Henry had caught her eye and she had blushed so rosy red, I had seen that the incident had not escaped this man's notice, and what is more that it was eminently disagreeable to him, for he bit his lip and his hand tightened on his sword hilt. Afterwards we learnt that he was an aspirant for the hand of this queen in marriage, which accounted for it. This being so, Nyleptha could not have appealed to a worse person, for, speaking in slow, heavy tones, he appeared to confirm all that the high priest Agon had said. As he spoke, Sorais put her elbow on her knee, and resting her chin on her hand, looked at him with a suppressed smile upon her lips, as though she saw through the man, and was determined to be his match. But Nyleptha grew very angry, her cheek flushed, her eyes flashed, and she did indeed look lovely. Finally she turned to Agon, and seemed to give some sort of qualified assent, for he bowed at her words, and as she spoke she moved her hands as though to emphasize what she said. While all the time, Seresis kept her chin on her hand and smiled. Then suddenly Nyleptha made a sign, the trumpets blew again, and everybody rose to leave the hall, save ourselves and the guards whom she motioned to stay. When they were all gone, she bent forward and, smiling sweetly, partially by signs and partially by exclamations, made it clear to us that she was very anxious to know where we came from. The difficulty was how to explain, but at last an idea struck me. I had my large pocket book in my pocket and a pencil. Taking it out, I made a little sketch of a lake, and then as best I could I drew the underground river and the lake at the other end. When I had done this I advanced to the steps of the throne and gave it to her. She understood it at once and clapped her hands with delight, and then descending from the throne took it to her sister Sorasis, who also evidently understood. Next she took the pencil from me, and after examining it with curiosity proceeded to make a series of delightful little sketches, the first representing herself holding out both hands in welcome, and a man uncommonly like Sir Henry taking them. Next she drew a lovely little picture of a hippopotamus rolling about dying in the water, and of an individual in whom we had no difficulty in recognizing Agon the high priest, holding up his hands in horror on the bank. Then followed a most alarming picture of a dreadful fiery furnace, and of the same figure, Agon, poking us into it with a forked stick. This picture perfectly horrified me, but I was a little reassured when she nodded sweetly and proceeded to make a fourth drawing. A man, again uncommonly like Sir Henry, and of two women, in whom I recognized Seresis and herself, each with one arm around him and holding a sword in protection over him. To all of these, Seresis, who I saw was employed in carefully taking us all in, especially Curtis, signified her approval by nodding. At last, Nyleptha drew a final sketch of a rising sun, indicating that she must go, and that we should meet on the following morning whereat Sir Henry looked so disappointed that she saw it, and, I suppose by way of consolation, extended her hand to him to kiss, which he did with pious fervor. At the same time, Sorasis, of whom Good had never taken his eyeglass during the whole Indaba interview, rewarded him by giving him her hand to kiss, though while she did so, her eyes were fixed upon Sir Henry. I am glad to say that I was not implicated in these proceedings, neither of them gave me her hand to kiss. Then Nyleptha turned and addressed the man who appeared to be in command of the bodyguard, apparently from her manner and his frequent obeisances, giving him very stringent and careful orders, after which, with a somewhat coquettish nod and smile, she left the hall, 
followed by Seracis and most of the guards. When the queens had gone, the officer whom Nyleptha had addressed came forward and with many tokens of deep respect led us from the hall through various passages to a sumptuous set of apartments opening out of a large central room lighted with brazen swinging lamps, for it was now dusk, and richly carpeted and strewn with couches. On a table in the center of the room was set a profusion of food and fruit, and what is more, flowers. There was a delicious wine, also, in ancient-looking sealed earthenware flagons, and beautifully chased golden and ivory cups to drink it from. Servants, male and female, also were there to minister to us, and whilst we ate, from some recess outside the apartment, the silver lute did speak between the trumpet's lordly blowing, and altogether we found ourselves in a sort of earthly paradise, which was only disturbed by the vision of that disgusting high priest who intended to commit us to the flames. But so very weary were we with our labors that we could scarcely keep ourselves awake through the sumptuous meal, and as soon as it was over we indicated that we desired to sleep. As a further precaution against surprise, we left Umslopogaas with his axe to sleep in the main chamber near the curtained doorways leading to the apartments which we occupied, respectively Good and I in the one, and Sir Henry and Alphonse in the other. Then, throwing off our clothes, with the exception of the male shirts, which we considered it safer to keep on, we flung ourselves down upon the low and luxurious couches, and drew the silk-embroidered coverlids over us. In two minutes I was just dropping off, when I was aroused by Good's voice. "'I say, Quatermain,' he said, "'did you ever see such eyes?' "'Eyes?' I said crossly. "'What eyes?' "'Why, the Queen's, of course. Seracis, I mean. At least I think that is her name.' "'Oh, I don't know,' I yawned. "'I didn't notice them much. "'I suppose they are good eyes.' "'And again I dropped off. Five minutes or so elapsed, "'and I was once more awakened. "'I say, Quatermain,' said the voice. "'Well,' I answered testily, "'what is it now? "'Did you notice her ankle? "'The shape?' "'This was more than I could stand.' By my bed stood the veldtskuns I had been wearing. Moved quite beyond myself, I took them up and threw them straight at Good's head, and hit it. Afterwards I slept the sleep of the just, and a very heavy sleep it must be. As for Good, I don't know if he went to sleep, or if he continued to pass a race's beauties in mental review, and what is more, I don't care. Chapter 13 About the Zuvandi People And now the curtain is down for a few hours, and the actors in this novel drama are plunged in dewy sleep. Perhaps we should accept Nyleptha, whom the reader may, if poetically inclined, imagine lying in her bed of state, encompassed by her maidens, tiring women, guards, and all the other people and appurtenances that surround a throne, and yet not able to slumber, for thinking of the strangers who had visited a country where no such strangers had ever come before, and wondering, as she lay awake, who they were, and what their past had been, and if she was ugly compared to the women of their native place. I, however, not being poetically inclined, We'll take advantage of the lull to give some account of the people among whom we found ourselves, compiled, needless to state, from information which we subsequently collected. The name of this country, to begin at the beginning, is Zuvendis, from Zu, yellow, and Vendis, place or country. Why it is called the Yellow Country, I have never been able to ascertain accurately, nor do the inhabitants themselves know. 
Three reasons are, however, given, each of which would suffice to account for it. The first is that the name owes its origin to the great quantity of gold that is to be found in the land. Indeed, in this respect, Zu Vendis is a veritable El Dorado, the precious metal being extraordinarily plentiful. At present it is collected from purely alluvial diggings, which we subsequently inspected, and which are situated within a day's journey from Milosis, being mostly found in pockets and in nuggets weighing from an ounce up to six or seven pounds in weight. But other diggings of a similar nature are known to exist, and I have besides seen great veins of gold-bearing quartz. In Zuvendis, gold is a much commoner metal than silver, and thus it has curiously enough come to pass that silver is the legal tender of the country. The second reason given is that at certain times of the year the native grasses of the country, which are very sweet and good, turn as yellow as ripe corn, and the third arises from a tradition that the people were originally yellow-skinned, but grew white after living for many generations upon these high lands. Zuvendis is a country about the size of France, is, roughly speaking, oval in shape, and on every side cut off from the surrounding territory by illimitable forests of impenetrable thorn, beyond which are said to be hundreds of miles of morasses, deserts, and great mountains. It is, in short, a huge high tableland rising up in the center of the dark continent, much as in southern Africa flat-topped mountains rise from the level of the surrounding veldt. Milosis itself lies, according to my aneroid, at a level of about 9,000 feet above the sea. But most of the land is even higher, the greatest elevation of the open country being, I believe, about 11,000 feet. As a consequence, the climate is, comparatively speaking, a cold one, being very similar to that of southern England, only brighter and not so rainy. The land is, however, exceedingly fertile, and grows all cereals and temperate fruits and timber to perfection, and in the low-lying parts even produces a hardy variety of sugar cane. Coal is found in great abundance, and in many places crops out from the surface, and so is pure marble, both black and white. The same may be said of almost every metal except silver, which is scarce, and only to be obtained from a range of mountains in the north. Zuvendis comprises in her boundaries a great variety of scenery, including two ranges of snow-clad mountains, one on the western boundary beyond the impenetrable belt of thorn forest, and the other piercing the country from north to south and passing at a distance of about 80 miles from Milosis, from which town its higher peaks are distinctly visible. This range forms the chief watershed of the land. There are also three large lakes, the biggest, namely that whereon we emerged, and which is named Milosis after the city, covering some 200 square miles of country, and numerous small ones, some of them salt. The population of this favored land is, comparatively speaking, dense, numbering at a rough estimate from 10 to 12 millions. It is almost purely agricultural in its habits and divided into great classes as in civilized countries. There is a territorial nobility, a considerable middle class, formed principally of merchants, officers of the army, etc. But the great bulk of the people are well-to-do peasants who live upon the lands of the lords from whom they hold under a species of feudal tenure. The best-bred people in the country are, as I think I have said, pure whites with a somewhat southern cast of countenance. But the common herd are much darker, though they do not show any Negro or other African characteristics. 
As to their descent, I can give no certain information. Their written records, which extend back for about a thousand years, give no hint of it. One very ancient chronicler does indeed, in alluding to some old tradition that existed in his day, talk of it as having probably originally come down with the people from the coast, but that may mean little or nothing. In short, the origin of the Zuvendi is lost in the mists of time. Whence they came, or of what race they are, no man knows. Their architecture and some of their sculpture suggests an Egyptian or possibly an Assyrian origin. But it is well known that their present remarkable style of building has only sprung up within the last 800 years, and they certainly retain no traces of Egyptian theology or customs. Again, their appearance and some of their habits are rather Jewish, but here again it seems hardly conceivable that they should have utterly lost all traces of the Jewish religion. Still, for aught I know, they may be one of the lost ten tribes whom people are so fond of discovering all over the world, or they may not. I do not know, and so can only describe them as I find them, and leave wiser heads than mine to make what they can out of it, if indeed this account should ever be read at all, which is exceedingly doubtful. And now, after I have said all this, I am, after all, going to hazard a theory of my own, though it is only a very little one, as the young lady said in mitigation of her baby. This theory is founded on a legend which I have heard among the Arabs on the east coast, which is to the effect that more than two thousand years ago there were troubles in the country which was known as Babylonia, and that thereon a vast horde of Persians came down to Bushire, where they took ship and were driven by the northeast monsoon to the east coast of Africa, where, according to the legend, the sun and fire worshippers fell into conflict with the belt of Arab settlers, who even then were settled on the east coast, and finally broke their way through them, and vanishing into the interior were no more seen. Now I ask, is it not at least possible that the Zuvendi people are the descendants of these sun and fire worshippers who broke through the Arabs and vanished? As a matter of fact, there is a good deal in their characters and customs that tallies with the somewhat vague ideas that I have of Persians. Of course, we have no books of reference here, but Sir Henry says that if his memory does not fail him, there was a tremendous revolt in Babylon about 500 B.C., whereon a vast multitude were expelled from the city. Anyhow, it is a well-established fact that there have been many separate emigrations of Persians from the Persian Gulf to the east coast of Africa up to as lately as 700 years ago. There are Persian tombs at Kalwa on the east coast, still in good repair, which bear dates showing them to be just 700 years old. End note. There is another theory which might account for the origin of the Zuvendi, which does not seem to have struck my friend Mr. Quatermain and his companions, and that is that they are descendants of the Phoenicians. The cradle of the Phoenician race is supposed to have been on the western shore of the Persian Gulf. Thence, as there is good evidence to show, they emigrated in two streams, one of which took possession of the shores of Palestine, while the other is supposed by savants to have immigrated down the coast of eastern Africa, where, near Mozambique, signs and remains of their occupation are not wanting. Indeed, it would have been very extraordinary if they did not, when leaving the Persian Gulf, make straight for the east coast, seeing that the northeast monsoon blows for six months in the year dead in that direction while for the other six months it blows back again. And, by the way of illustrating the probability, I may add that to this day a very extensive trade is carried on between the Persian Gulf and Lamu and other East African ports as far south as Madagascar, which is, of course, the ancient ebony isle of the Arabian Nights. 
editor. In addition to being an agricultural people, the Zuvendi are, oddly enough, excessively warlike, and as they cannot from the exigencies of their position make war upon other nations, they fight among each other like the famed Kilkenny cats, with the happy result that the population never outgrows the power of the country to support it. This habit of theirs is largely fostered by the political condition of the country. The monarchy is nominally an absolute one, save in so far as it is tempered by the power of the priests and the informal council of the great lords. But as in many other institutions, the king's writ does not run unquestioned throughout the length and breadth of the land. In short, the whole system is a purely feudal one, though absolute serfdom or slavery is unknown, all the great lords holding nominally from the throne, but a number of them being practically independent, having the power of life and death, waging war against and making peace with their neighbors as the whim or their interests lead them, and even on occasion rising in open rebellion against their royal master or mistress, and safely shut up in their castles and fenced cities as far from the seat of government, successfully defying them for years. Zuvendis has had its kingmakers as well as England, a fact that will be well appreciated when I state that eight different dynasties have sat upon the throne in the last one thousand years, every one of which took its rise from some noble family that succeeded in grasping the purple after a sanguinary struggle. At the date of our arrival in the country, things were a little better than they had been for some centuries. The last king, the father of Nilepha and Soresis, having been an exceptionally able and vigorous ruler, and, as a consequence, he kept down the power of the priests and nobles. On his death, two years before we reached Zuvendis, the twin sisters, his children, were, following an ancient precedent, called to the throne, since an attempt to exclude either would instantly have provoked a sanguinary civil war but it was generally felt in the country that this measure was a most unsatisfactory one and could hardly be expected to be permanent. Indeed, as it was, the various intrigues that were set on foot by ambitious nobles to obtain the hand of one or the other of the queens in marriage had disquieted the country, and the general opinion was that there would be bloodshed before long. I will now pass on to the question of the Zuvandi religion, which is nothing more or less than sun worship of a pronounced and highly developed character. Around this sun worship is grouped the entire social system of the Zuvendi. It sends its roots through every institution and custom of the land. From the cradle to the grave, the Zuvendi follows the sun in every sense of the saying. As an infant, he is solemnly held up in its light and dedicated to the symbol of good, the expression of power, and the hope of eternity, the ceremony answering to our baptism. Whilst still a tiny child, his parents point out the glorious orb as the presence of a visible and beneficent God, and he worships it at its uprising and downsetting. Then, when still quite small, he goes, holding fast to the pendant end of his mother's calf, Toga, up to the temple of the sun of the nearest city, and there, when at midday the bright beams strike down upon the golden central altar and beat back the fire that burns thereon, he hears the white-robed priests raise their solemn chant of praise and sees the people fall down to a door, and then, amidst the blowing of the golden trumpets, watches the sacrifice thrown into the fiery furnace beneath the altar. Here he comes again to be declared a man by the priests, and consecrated to war and to good works. Here before the solemn altar he leads his bride. And here, too, if differences shall unhappily arise, he divorces her. And so on, down life's long pathway, till the last mile is travelled 
and he comes again armed indeed, and with dignity, but no longer a man. Here they bear him dead, and lay his bier upon the falling brazen doors before the eastern altar, and when the last ray from the setting sun falls upon his white face, the bolts are drawn, and he vanishes into the raging furnace beneath, and is ended. The priests of the sun do not marry, but are recruited as young men specially devoted to the work by their parents, and supported by the state. The nomination to the higher offices of the priesthood lies with the crown, but once appointed the nominees cannot be dispossessed, and it is scarcely too much to say that they really rule the land. To begin with, they are a united body, sworn to obedience and secrecy, so that an order issued by the high priest at Milosis will be instantly and unhesitatingly acted upon by the resident priest of a little country town three or four hundred miles off. They are the judges of the land, criminal and civil, an appeal lying only to the Lord Paramount of the district, and from him to the king. And they have, of course, practically unlimited jurisdiction over religious and moral offenses, together with a right of excommunication, which, as in the faiths of more highly civilized lands, is a very effective weapon. Indeed, their rights and powers are almost unlimited, but I may as well state here that the priests of the sun are wise in their generation, and do not push things too far. It is but very seldom that they go to extremes against anybody, being more inclined to exercise the prerogative of mercy than run the risk of exasperating the powerful and vigorous-minded people on whose neck they have set their yoke, lest it should rise and break it off altogether. Another source of the power of the priests is their practical monopoly of learning, and their very considerable astronomical knowledge, which enables them to keep a hold on the popular mind by predicting eclipses and even comets. In Zuvendis only a few of the upper classes can read and write, but nearly all the priests have this knowledge, and are therefore looked upon as learned men. The law of the country is, on the whole, mild and just, but differs in several respects from our civilized law. For instance, the law of England is much more severe upon offenses against property than against the person, as becomes a people whose ruling passion is money. A man may half kick his wife to death, or inflict horrible sufferings upon his children, at a much cheaper rate of punishment than he can compound for the theft of a pair of old boots. In Zuvendis this is not so for there they, rightly or wrongly, look upon the person as of more consequence than goods and chattels, and not, as in England, as a sort of necessary appendage to the latter. For murder the punishment is death, for treason death, for defrauding the orphan and the widow, for sacrilege, and for attempting to quit the country, which is looked on as a sacrilege, death. In each case, the method of execution is the same, and a rather awful one. The culprit is thrown alive into the fiery furnace beneath one of the altars to the sun. For all other offenses, including the offense of idleness, the punishment is forced labor upon the vast national buildings which are always going on in some part of the country, with or without periodical floggings, according to the crime. The social system of Zuvandi allows considerable liberty to the individual, provided he does not offend against the laws and customs of the country. They are polygamous in theory, though most of them have only one wife on account of the expense. By law, a man is bound to provide a separate establishment for each wife. The first wife also is the legal wife, and her children are said to be of the house of the father. The children of the other wives are of the houses of their respective mothers. 
This does not, however, imply any slur upon either mother or children. Again, a first wife can, on entering into the married state, make a bargain that her husband shall marry no other wife. This, however, is very rarely done, as the women are the great upholders of polygamy, which not only provides for their surplus numbers, but gives greater importance to the first wife, who is thus practically the head of several households. Marriage is looked upon as primarily a civil contract, and, subject to certain conditions and to a proper provision for children, is dissoluble at the will of both contracting parties, the divorce, or unloosing, being formally and ceremoniously accomplished by going through certain portions of the marriage ceremony backwards. The Zuvendi are on the whole a very kindly, pleasant, and light-hearted people. They are not great traders and care little about money, only working to earn enough to support themselves in that class of life in which they were born. They are exceedingly conservative and look with disfavor upon changes. Their legal tender is silver cut into little squares of different weights. Gold is the baser coin and is about the same value as our silver. It is, however, much prized for its beauty, and largely used for ornaments and decorative purposes. Most of the trade, however, is carried on by means of sale and barter, payment being made in kind. Agriculture is the great business of the country, and is really well understood and carried out most of the available acreage being under cultivation. Great attention is also given to the breeding of cattle and horses, the latter being unsurpassed by any I have ever seen, either in Europe or Africa. The land belongs theoretically to the crown, and under the crown to the great lords, who again divide it among smaller lords, and so on down to the little peasant farmer who works his forty ristu acres on a system of half profits with his immediate lord. In fact, the whole system is, as I have said, distinctly feudal, and it interested us much to meet with such an old friend far in the unknown heart of Africa. The taxes are very heavy. The state takes a third of a man's total earnings, and the priesthood about five percent on the remainder. But on the other hand, if a man through any cause falls into bona fide misfortune, the state supports him in the position of life to which he belongs. If he is idle, however, he is sent to work on the government undertakings, and the state looks after his wives and children. The state also makes all the roads and builds all townhouses, about which great care is shown letting them out to families at a small rent. It also keeps up a standing army of about 20,000 men and provides watchmen, etc. In return for their 5%, the priests attend to the service of the temples, carry out all religious ceremonies, and keep schools where they teach whatever they think desirable, which is not very much. Some of the temples also possess private property, but priests as individuals cannot hold property. And now comes a question which I find some difficulty in answering. Are the Zuvendi a civilized or barbarous people? Sometimes I think the one, sometimes the other. In some branches of art they have attained the very highest proficiency. Take for instance their buildings and their statuary. I do not think that the latter can be equaled either in beauty or imaginative power anywhere in the world. And as for the former, it may have been rivaled in ancient Egypt, but I am sure that it has never been since. But on the other hand, they are totally ignorant of many other arts, till Sir Henry, who happened to know something about it, showed them how to do it by mixing silica and lime they could not make a piece of glass, and their crockery is rather primitive. 
A water clock is their nearest approach to a watch. Indeed, ours delighted them exceedingly. They know nothing about steam, electricity, or gunpowder, and mercifully for themselves nothing about printing or the penny post. Thus they are spared many evils, for of a truth our age has learnt the wisdom of the old world saying, He who increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. As regards their religion, it is a natural one for imaginative people who know no better, and might therefore be expected to turn to the Son and worship Him as the All-Father. But it cannot justly be called elevating or spiritual. It is true that they do sometimes speak of the Son as the garment of the Spirit, but it is a vague term, and what they really adore is the fiery orb himself. They also call him the hope of eternity, but here again the meaning is vague, and I doubt if the phrase conveys any very clear impression to their minds. Some of them do indeed believe in a future life for the good. I know Nilepsa does firmly, but it is a private faith arising from the promptings of the Spirit, not an essential of their creed. So on the whole I cannot say that I consider this sun worship as a religion indicative of a civilized people, however magnificent and imposing its ritual, or however moral and high-sounding the maxims of its priests, many of whom, I am sure, have their own opinions on the whole subject, though of course they have nothing but praise for a system which provides them with so many of the good things of this world. There are now only two more matters to which I need allude, namely the language and the system of calligraphy. As for the former, it is soft-sounding and very rich and flexible. Sir Henry says, that it sounds something like modern Greek, but of course it has no connection with it. It is easy to acquire, being simple in its construction, and a peculiar quality about it is its euphony, and the way in which the sound of the words adapts itself to the meaning to be expressed. Long before we mastered the language, we could frequently make out what was meant by the ring of the sentence. It is on this account that the language lends itself so well to poetical declamation, of which these remarkable people are very fond. The Zuvendi alphabet seems, Sir Henry says, to be derived, like every other known system of letters, from a Phoenician source, and therefore more remotely still from the ancient Egyptian hieratic writing. Whether this is a fact I cannot say, not being learned in such matters. All I know about it is that their alphabet consists of 22 characters, of which a few, notably B, E, and O, are not very unlike our own. The whole affair is, however, clumsy and puzzling. End note. There are 22 letters in the Phoenician alphabet. See Appendix, Maspro's Histoire Ancienne des Peuples de l'Orient, page 746, etc. Unfortunately, Mr. Quatermain gives us no specimen of the Zuvendi writing, but what he here states seems to go a long way towards substantiating the theory advanced in the note on page 149. Editor. But as the people of Zuvendi are not given to the writing of novels or of anything except business documents and records of the briefest character, it answers their purpose well enough. Chapter 14 The Flower Temple It was half past eight by my watch when I woke on the morning following our arrival at Milosis, having slept almost exactly twelve hours, and I must say that I did indeed feel better. Ah, what a blessed thing is sleep, and what a difference twelve hours of it or so makes to us after days and nights of toil and danger. It is like going to bed one man and getting up another. 
I sat up upon my silken couch, never had I slept upon such a bed before, and the first thing that I saw was Good's eyeglass fixed on me from the recesses of his silken couch. There was nothing else of him to be seen except his eyeglass, but I knew from the look of it that he was awake and waiting till I woke up to begin. I say, Quatermain, he commenced sure enough, did you observe her skin? It is as smooth as the back of an ivory hairbrush. Now look here, good, I remonstrated, when there came a sound at the curtain, which, on being drawn, admitted a functionary, who signified by signs that he was there to lead us to the bath. We gladly consented, and were conducted to a delightful marble chamber with a pool of running crystal water in the center of it, into which we gaily plunged. When we had bathed, we returned to our apartment and dressed, and then went into the central room where we had supped on the previous evening to find a morning meal already prepared for us. And a capital meal it was, though I should be puzzled to describe the dishes. After breakfast we lounged round and admired the tapestries and carpets and some pieces of statuary that were placed about, wondering the while what was going to happen next. Indeed, by this time, our minds were in such a state of complete bewilderment that we were, as a matter of fact, ready for anything that might arrive. As for our sense of astonishment, it was pretty well obliterated. Whilst we were still thus engaged, our friend, the captain of the guard, presented himself, and with many obeisances signified that we were to follow him, which we did, not without doubts and heart-searchings, for we guessed that the time had come when we should have to settle the bill for those confounded hippopotami with our cold-eyed friend Agon, the high priest. However, there was no help for it, and personally I took great comfort in the promise of the protection of the sister queens, knowing that if ladies have a will, they can generally find a way. So off we started as though we liked it. A minute's walk through a passage and an outer court brought us to the great double gates of the palace that open on to the wide highway which runs uphill through the heart of Milosis to the Temple of the Sun a mile away, and thence down the slope on the farther side of the temple to the outer wall of the city. These gates are very large and massive, and an extraordinarily beautiful work in metal. Between them, for one set is placed at the entrance to an interior, and one at that of the exterior wall, is a foss. 45 feet in width. This foss is filled with water and spanned by a drawbridge, which when lifted makes the palace nearly impregnable to anything except siege guns. As we came, one half of the wide gates were flung open, and we passed over the drawbridge, and presently stood gazing up one of the most imposing, if not the most imposing, roadways in the world. It is a hundred feet from curb to curb, and on either side, not cramped and crowded together, as is our European fashion, but each standing in its own grounds, and built equidistant from, and in similar style to the rest, are a series of splendid single-storied mansions, all of red granite. These are the town houses of the nobles of the court, and stretch away in unbroken lines for a mile or more till the eye is arrested by the glorious vision of the Temple of the Sun that crowns the hill and heads the roadway. As we stood gazing at this splendid sight, of which more anon, there suddenly dashed up to the gateway four chariots, each drawn by two white horses. These chariots are two-wheeled and made of wood. They are fitted with a stout pole, the weight of which is supported by leathern girths that form a portion of the harness. The wheels are made with four spokes only, are tired with iron, and quite innocent of springs. 
In the front of the chariot, and immediately over the pole, is a small seat for the driver, railed round to prevent him from being jolted off. Inside the machine itself are three low seats, one at each side, and one with the back to the horses, opposite to which is the door. The whole vehicle is lightly and yet strongly made, and owing to the grace of the curves, though primitive, not half so ugly as might be expected. But if the chariots left something to be desired, the horses did not. They were simply splendid, not very large, but strongly built, and well ribbed up, with small heads, remarkably large and round hooves, and a great look of speed and blood. I have often wondered whence this breed, which presents many distinct characteristics, came, but like that of its owners, its history is obscure. Like the people, the horses have always been there. The first and last of these chariots were occupied by guards, but the center two were empty, except for the driver, and to these we were conducted. Alphonse and I got into the first, and Sir Henry, Good, and Umslopogas into the one behind, and then suddenly off we went. And we did go. Among the Zuvendi it is not usual to trot horses either riding or driving, especially when the journey to be made is a short one. They go at full gallop. As soon as we were seated, the driver called out, the horses sprang forward, and we were whirled away at a speed sufficient to take one's breath, and which, till I got accustomed to it, kept me in momentary fear of an upset. As for the wretched Alphonse, he clung with a despairing face to the side of what he called this devil of a fiacre, thinking that every moment was his last. Presently it occurred to him to ask where we were going, and I told him that, as far as I could ascertain, we were going to be sacrificed by burning. You should have seen his face as he grasped the side of the vehicle and cried out in his terror. But the wild-looking charioteer only leant forward over his flying steeds and shouted, and the air, as it went singing past, bore away the sound of Alphonse's lamentations. And now before us, in all its marvelous splendor and dazzling loveliness, shone out the Temple of the Sun, the peculiar pride of the Zuvendi, to whom it was what Solomon's, or rather Herod's, temple was to the Jews. The wealth and skill and labor of generations had been given to the building of this wonderful place, which had been only finally completed within the last fifty years. Nothing was spared that the country could produce, and the result was indeed worthy of the effort, not so much on account of its size, for there are larger fanes in the world, as because of its perfect proportions, the richness and beauty of its materials, and the wonderful workmanship. The building that stands by itself on a space of some eight acres of garden ground on the hilltop, around which are the dwelling places of the priests, is built in the shape of a sunflower, with a dome-covered central hall, from which radiate twelve petal-shaped courts, each dedicated to one of the twelve months, and serving as the repositories of statues reared in memory of the illustrious dead. The width of the circle beneath the dome is 300 feet, the height of the dome is 400 feet, and the length of the rays is 150 feet, and the height of their roofs 300 feet, so that they run into the central dome exactly as the petals of the sunflower run into the great raised heart. Thus the exact measurement from the center of the central altar to the extreme point at any one of the rounded rays would be 300 feet, the width of the circle itself, or a total of 600 feet from the rounded extremity of one ray or petal to the extremity of the opposite one. End note. These are internal measurements. Alan Quatermain. 
The building itself is a pure and polished white marble, which shows out in marvelous contrast to the red granite of the frowning city, on whose brow it glistens indeed like an imperial diadem upon the forehead of a dusky queen. The outer surface of the dome and of the twelve petal courts is covered entirely with thin sheets of beaten gold, and from the extreme point of the roof of each of these petals a glorious golden form with a trumpet in its hand and widespread wings is figured in the very act of soaring into space. I really must leave whoever reads this to imagine the surpassing beauty of these golden roofs flashing when the sun strikes, flashing like a thousand fires of flame on a mountain of polished marble, so fiercely that the reflection can be clearly seen from the great peaks of the range a hundred miles away. It is a marvelous sight, this golden flower upborne upon the cool white marble walls, and I doubt if the world can show such another. What makes the whole effect even more gorgeous is that a belt of a hundred and fifty feet around the marble wall of the temple is planted with an indigenous species of sunflower, which were at the time when we first saw them a sheet of golden bloom. The main entrance to this wonderful place is between the two northernmost of the rays or petal courts, and is protected first by the usual bronze gates, and then by doors made of solid marble, beautifully carved with allegorical subjects and overlaid with gold. When these are passed, there is only the thickness of the wall, which is, however, twenty-five feet, for the Zuvendi build for all time and another slight wall, also of white marble, introduced in order to avoid causing a visible gap in the inner skin of the wall. And you stand in the circular hall under the great dome. Advancing to the central altar, you look upon as beautiful a sight as the imagination of man can conceive. You are in the middle of the holy place, and above you the great white marble dome for the inner skin, like the outer, is of polished marble throughout, arches away in graceful curves, something like that of St. Paul's in London, only at a slighter angle, and from the funnel-like opening at the exact apex, a bright beam of light pours down upon the golden altar. At the east and the west are other altars, and other beams of light stab the sacred twilight to the heart. In every direction, white, mystic, wonderful, open out the ray-like courts, each pierced through by a single arrow of light that serves to illumine its lofty silence and dimly to reveal the monuments of the dead. End note. Light was also admitted by sliding shutters under the eaves of the dome and in the roof. Alan Quatermain Overcome at so awe-inspiring a sight, the vast loveliness of which thrills the nerves like a glance from a beauty's eyes, you turn to the central golden altar, in the midst of which, though you cannot see it now, there burns a pale but steady flame, crowned with curls of faint blue smoke. It is of marble, overlaid with pure gold, in shape round like the sun, four feet in height and thirty-six in circumference. Here also, hinged to the foundations of the altar, are twelve petals of beaten gold. All night, and except at one hour, all day also, these petals are closed over the altar itself, exactly as the petals of a water lily close over the yellow crown in stormy weather. But when the sun at midday pierces through the funnel in the dome and lights upon the golden flower, the petals open and reveal the hidden mystery, only to close again when the ray has passed. Nor is this all. Standing in semicircles at equal distances from each other on the north and south of the sacred place are ten golden angels, or female winged forms, exquisitely shaped and draped. These figures, which are slightly larger than life-size, 
stand with bent heads in an attitude of adoration, their faces shadowed by their wings, and are most imposing and of exceeding beauty. There is but one thing further which calls for description in this altar, which is that to the east the flooring in front of it is not of pure white marble, as elsewhere throughout the building, but of solid brass, and this is also the case in front of the other two altars. The eastern and western altars, which are semicircular in shape and placed against the wall of the building, are much less imposing and are not enfolded in golden petals. They are, however, also of gold. The sacred fire burns on each, and a golden-winged figure stands on either side of them. Two great golden rays run up the wall behind them, but where the third or middle one should be is an opening in the wall, wide on the outside, but narrow within, like a loophole turned inwards. Through the eastern loophole stream the first beams of the rising sun, and strike right across the circle, touching the folded petals of the great gold flower as they pass, till they impinge upon the western altar. In the same way, at night the last rays of the sinking sun rest for a while on the eastern altar before they die away into darkness. It is the promise of the dawn to the evening, and the evening to the dawn. With the exception of those three altars and the winged figures about them, the whole space beneath the vast white dome is utterly emptied and devoid of ornamentation, a circumstance that to my fancy adds greatly to its splendor. Such is a brief description of this wonderful and lovely building, to the glories of which, to my mind so much enhanced by their complete simplicity, I only wish I had the power to do justice. But I cannot, so it is useless talking more about it. But when I compare this great work of genius to some of the tawdry buildings and tinsel ornamentation produced in these latter days by European ecclesiastical architects, I feel that even highly civilized art might learn something from the Zuvendi masterpieces. I can only say that the exclamation which sprang to my lips as soon as my eyes first became accustomed to the dim light of that glorious building and its white and curving beauties, perfect and thrilling as those of a naked goddess, grew upon me one by one, was, well, a dog would feel religious here. It is vulgarly put, but perhaps it conveys my meaning more clearly than any polished utterance. At the temple gates our party was received by a guard of soldiers who appeared to be under the orders of a priest, and by them we were conducted into one of the ray, or petal courts, as the priests call them, and there left for at least half an hour. Here we conferred together and realizing that we stood in great danger of our lives, determined if any attempt should be made upon us to sell them as dearly as we could. Umslopogaas announcing his fixed intention of committing sacrilege on the person of Agon, the high priest, by splitting his head with Nkosikas. From where we stood we could perceive that an immense multitude were pouring into the temple, evidently an expectation of some unusual event, and I could not help fearing that we had to do with it. And here I may explain that every day, when the sunlight falls upon the central altar and the trumpets sound, a burnt sacrifice is altered to the sun, consisting generally of the carcass of a sheep or ox, or sometimes of fruit or corn. This event comes off about midday, of course not always exactly at that hour, but as Zuvendis is situated not far from the line, although being so high above the sea it is very temperate, midday and the falling of the sunlight on the altar were generally simultaneous. Today the sacrifice was to take place at about eight minutes past twelve. Just at twelve o'clock a priest appeared 
and made a sign, and the officer of the guard signified to us that we were expected to advance, which we did with the best grace that we could muster, all except Alphonse, whose irrepressible teeth instantly began to chatter. In a few seconds we were out of the court and looking at a vast sea of human faces stretching away to the farthest limits of the great circle, all straining to catch a glimpse of the mysterious strangers who had committed sacrilege, the first strangers, mind you, who, to the knowledge of the multitude, had ever set foot in Zuvendis since such time that the memory of man runneth not to the contrary. As we appeared there was a murmur through the vast crowd then went echoing away up the great dome, and we saw a visible blush of excitement grow on the thousands of faces, like a pink light on a stretch of pale cloud, and a very curious effect it was. On we passed, down a lane cut through the heart of the human mass, till presently we stood upon the brazen patch of flooring to the east of the central altar, and immediately facing it. For some thirty feet around the golden-winged figures, the space was roped off, and the multitudes stood outside the ropes. Within were a circle of white-robed, gold-cinctured priests holding long golden trumpets in their hands, and immediately in front of us was our friend Agon, the high priest, with his curious cap upon his head. His was the only covered head in that vast assemblage. We took our stand upon the brazen space, little knowing what was prepared for us beneath. But I noticed a curious hissing sound proceeding apparently from the floor, for which I could not account. Then came a pause, and I looked around to see if there was any sign of the two queens, Nilepha and Soraces, but they were not there. To the right of us, however, was a bare space that I guess was reserved for them. We waited, and presently a far-off trumpet blew, apparently high up in the dome. Then came another murmur from the multitude, and up a long lane, leading to the open space to our right, we saw the two queens walking side by side. Behind them were some nobles of the court, among whom I recognized the great lord Nasta, and behind them again a body of about fifty guards. These last I was very glad to see. Presently they had all arrived and taken their stand, the two queens in the front, the nobles to the right and left, and the guards in a double semicircle behind them. Then came another silence and Nilepso looked up and caught my eye. It seemed to me there was meaning in her glance, and I watched it narrowly. From my eye it traveled down to the brazen flooring, on the outer edge of which we stood. Then followed a slight and almost imperceptible sidelong movement of the head. I did not understand it, and it was repeated. Then I guessed that she meant us to move back off the brazen floor. One more glance and I was sure of it. There was danger in standing on the floor. Sir Henry was placed on one side of me, Umslopogas on the other. Keeping my eyes fixed straight before me, I whispered to them, first in Zulu and then in English, to draw slowly back inch by inch till half their feet were resting on the marble flooring where the brass ceased. Sir Henry whispered on to Good and Alphonse, and slowly, very, very slowly, we shifted backwards, so slowly that nobody, except Nilepha and Sireus, who saw everything, seemed to notice the movement. Then I glanced again at Nilepha, and saw that, by an almost imperceptible nod, she indicated approval. All the while Agon's eyes were fixed upon the altar before him apparently in an ecstasy of contemplation, and mine were fixed upon the small of his back in another sort of ecstasy. Suddenly he flung up his long arm and in a solemn and resounding voice commenced a chant, of which for convenience sake 
I append a rough, a very rough, translation here, though of course I did not then comprehend its meaning. It was an invocation to the sun, and ran somewhat as follows. There is silence upon the face of the earth and the waters thereof. Yea, the silence doth brood on the waters like a nesting bird. The silence sleepeth also upon the bosom of the profound darkness. Only high up in the great spaces star doth speak unto star. The earth is faint with longing and wet with the tears of her desire. The star-girdled night doth embrace her, but she is not comforted. She lies enshrouded in mists like a corpse in the grave clothes, and stretches her pale hands to the east. Lo, away in the farthest east there is the shadow of a light. The earth seeth and lifts herself. She looks out from beneath the hollow of her hand. Then thy great angels fly forth from the holy place, O sun. They shoot their fiery swords into the darkness and shrivel it up. They climb the heavens and cast down the pale stars from their thrones. Yea, they hurl the changeful stars back into the womb of the night. They cause the moon to become wan as the face of a dying man. And behold, thy glory comes, O sun. O thou beautiful one, thou drapest thyself in fire. The wide heavens are thy pathway. Thou rollest o'er them as a chariot. The earth is thy bride. Thou dost embrace her, and she brings forth children. Yea, thou favorest her, and she yields her increase. Thou art the All-Father, and the giver of life, O Son. The young children stretch out their hands and grow in thy brightness. The old men creep forth, and seeing, remember their strength. Only the dead forget thee, O son. When thou art wroth, then thou dost hide thy face. Thou drawest around thee a thick curtain of shadows. Then the earth grows cold, and the heavens are dismayed. They tremble, and the sound thereof is the sound of thunder. They weep, and their tears are outpoured in the rain. They sigh, and the wild winds are the voice of their sighing. The flowers die, the fruitful fields languish and turn pale. The old men and the little children go into their appointed place when thou withdrawest thy light, O sun. Say, what art thou? O thou matchless splendor, who set thee on high, O thou flaming terror? When didst thou begin, and when is the day of thy ending? Thou art the raiment of the living spirit. End note. This line is interesting as being one of the few allusions to be found in the Zuvendi ritual to a vague divine essence independent of the material splendor of the orb they worship. Taia, the word used here, has a very indeterminate meaning and signifies essence, vital principle, spirit, or even God. None did place thee on high, for thou was the beginning. Thou shalt not be ended when thy children are forgotten. Nay, thou shalt never end, for thy hours are eternal. Thou sittest on high within thy golden house, and measurest out the centuries. O Father of life, O dark dispelling sun! He ceased this solemn chant, which, though it seems a poor enough thing after going through my mill, is really beautiful and impressive in the original. And then, after a moment's pause, he glanced up towards the funnel-sloped opening in the dome, and added, O sun, descend upon thine altar. As he spoke, a wonderful and beautiful thing happened. Down from on high flashed a splendid living ray of light, 
cleaving the twilight like a sword of fire. Full upon the closed petals it fell, and ran shimmering down their golden sides, and then the glorious flower opened as though beneath the bright influence. Slowly it opened, and as the great petals fell wide and revealed the golden altar on which the fire ever burns, the priests blew a blast upon the trumpets, and from all the people there rose a shout of praise that beat against the domed roof and came echoing down the marble walls. And the sunlight fell full upon the tongue of sacred flame and beat it down, so that it wavered, sank, and vanished into the hollow recesses whence it rose. As it vanished, the mellow notes of the trumpets rolled out once more. Again the old priest flung up his hands and called aloud, We sacrifice to thee, O son. Once more I caught and I left this eye. It was fixed upon the brazen flooring. Look out, I said aloud, and as I said it I saw Agon bend forward and touch something on the altar. As he did so, the great white sea of faces around us turned red and then white again, and a deep breath went up like a universal sigh. Nilepha leant forward and with an involuntary movement covered her eyes with her hand. Sereus turned and whispered to the officer of the royal bodyguard, and then with a rending sound the whole of the brazen flooring slid from before our feet and there in its place was suddenly revealed a smooth marble shaft terminating in a most awful raging furnace beneath the altar, big enough and hot enough to heat the iron stern post of a man of war. With a cry of terror we sprang backwards, all except the wretched Alphonse who was paralyzed with fear, and would have fallen into the fiery furnace which had been prepared for us had not Sir Henry caught him in his strong hand as he was vanishing and dragged him back. Instantly there arose the most fearful hubbub, and we four got back to back, Alphonse dodging frantically round our little circle in his attempts to take shelter under our legs. We all had our revolvers on, for though we had been politely disarmed of our guns on leaving the palace, of course these people did not know what a revolver was. Umslopogaas, too, had his axe, of which no effort had been made to deprive him, and now he whirled it round his head and sent his piercing Zulu war-shout echoing up the marble walls in fine, defiant fashion. Next second, the priests, baffled of their prey, had drawn swords from beneath their white robes and were leaping on us like hounds upon a stag at bay. I saw that dangerous as action might be, we must act or be lost. So as the first man came bounding along, and a great tall fellow he was, I sent a heavy revolver ball through him, and down he fell at the mouth of the shaft, and slid, shrieking frantically into the fiery gulf that had been prepared for us. Whether it was his cries, or the, to them, awful sound and effect of the pistol shot, or what, I know not, but the other priests halted, paralyzed and dismayed, and before they could come on again, Sereus had called out something, and we, together with the two queens and most of the courtiers, were being surrounded with a wall of armed men. In a moment it was done, and still the priests hesitated, and the people hung in the balance like a herd of startled buck, as it were, making no sign one way or the other. The last yell of the burning priest had died away, the fire had finished him, and a great silence fell upon the place. Then the high priest Agon turned, and his face was as the face of a devil. Let the sacrifice be sacrificed, he cried to the queens. Has not sacrilege enough been done by these strangers, and would ye, as queens, throw the cloak of your majesty over evildoers? Are not the creatures, sacred to the sun, dead? And is not a priest of the sun also dead? 
but now slain by the magic of these strangers, who come as the winds out of heaven, whence we know not, and who are what we know not. Beware, O queens, how ye tamper with the great majesty of the god, even before his high altar. There is a power that is more than your power. There is a justice that is higher than your justice. Beware how ye lift an impious hand against it. Let the sacrifice be sacrificed, O queens. Then Sirius made answer in her deep, quiet tones that always seemed to me to have a suspicion of mockery about them, however serious the theme. O Agon, thou hast spoken according to thy desire, and thou hast spoken truth. But it is thou who wouldst lift an impious hand against the justice of thy God. Bethink thee the midday sacrifice is accomplished. The sun hath claimed his priest as a sacrifice. This was a novel idea, and the people applauded it. Bethink thee, what are these men? They are strangers found floating on the bosom of a lake. Who brought them here? How came they here? How know you that they also are not servants of the sun? Is this the hospitality that ye would have our nation show to those whom chance brings to them, to throw them to the flames? Shame on you! Shame on you! What is hospitality? To receive the stranger and show him favor, to bind up his wounds and find a pillow for his head, and food for him to eat. But thy pillow is the fiery furnace, and thy food the hot savor of the flame. Shame on thee, I say. She paused a little to watch the effect of her speech upon the multitude, and seeing that it was favorable, changed her tone from one of remonstrance to one of command. Ho! Oh, place there, she cried. Place, I say, make way for the queens, and those whom the queens cover with their cough mantle. And if I refuse, O queen, said Agon between his teeth, then will I cut a path with my guards, was the proud answer. I, even in the presence of thy sanctuary, and through the bodies of thy priests. Agon turned livid with baffled fury. He glanced at the people as though meditating an appeal to them, but saw clearly that their sympathies were all the other way. The Zuvendi are a very curious and sociable people, and great as was their sense of the enormity that we had committed in shooting the sacred hippopotami, they did not like the idea of the only real live strangers they had seen or heard of being consigned to a fiery furnace, thereby putting an end forever to their chance of extracting knowledge and information from and gossiping about us. Agon saw this and hesitated, and then for the first time Nyleptha spoke in her soft, sweet voice. Bethink thee, Agon, she said, as my sister queen has said, these men may also be servants of the sun. For themselves they cannot speak, for their tongues are tied. Let the matter be adjourned till such time as they have learnt our language. Who can be condemned without a hearing? When these men can plead for themselves, then it will be time to put them to the proof. Here was a clever loophole of escape, and the vindictive old priest took it, little as he liked it. So be it, O queens, he said. Let the men go in peace, and when they have learnt our tongue, then let them speak. And I, even I, will make humble supplication at the altar, lest pestilence fall on the land by cause of the sacrilege. These words were received with a murmur of applause, 
and in another minute we were marching out of the temple, surrounded by the royal guards. But it was not till long afterwards that we learnt the exact substance of what had passed, and how hardly our lives had been wrung out of the cruel grip of the Zuvendi priesthood, in the face of which even the queens were practically powerless. Had it not been for their strenuous efforts to protect us, we should have been slain even before we set foot in the Temple of the Sun. The attempt to drop us bodily into the fiery pit as an offering was the last artifice to attain this end when several others, quite unsuspected by us, had already failed. Chapter 15 Sereus's Song after our escape from Agon and his pious crew, we returned to our quarters in the palace, and had a very good time. The two queens, the nobles, and the people vied with each other in doing us honor and showering gifts upon us. As for that painful little incident of the hippopotami, it sank into oblivion, where we were quite content to leave it. Every day deputations and individuals waited on us to examine our guns and clothing, our chain shirts, and our instruments, especially our watches, with which they were much delighted. In short, we became quite the rage, so much so that some of the fashionable young swells among the Zuvendi began to copy the cut of some of our clothes, notably Sir Henry's shooting jacket. One day, indeed, a deputation waited on us, and, as usual, Good donned his full-dress uniform for the occasion. This deputation seemed somehow to be a little different class to those who generally came to visit us. They were little insignificant men of an excessively polite, not to say servile, demeanor, and their attention appeared to be chiefly taken up with observing the details of Good's full-dress uniform of which they took copious notes and measurements. Good was much flattered at the time, not suspecting that he had to deal with the six leading tailors of Milosis. A fortnight afterwards, however, when, on attending court as usual, he had the pleasure of seeing some seven or eight Zuvendi mashers arrayed in all the glory of a very fair imitation of his full-dress uniform, he changed his mind. I shall never forget his face of astonishment and disgust. It was after this, chiefly to avoid remark, and also because our clothes were wearing out and had to be saved up, that we resolved to adopt the native dress, and a very comfortable one we found it, though I am bound to say that I look sufficiently ridiculous in it, and as for Alphonse, only Umslopogas would have none of these things. When his muka was worn out, the fierce old Zulu made him a new one, and went about unconcerned, as grim and naked as his own battle-axe. Meanwhile, we pursued our study of the language steadily, and made very good progress. On the morning following our adventure in the temple, three grave and reverend seniors presented themselves, armed with manuscript books, ink horns and feather pens, and indicated that they had been sent to teach us. So with the exception of Umslopogas, we all buckled to with a will, doing four hours a day. As for Umslopogas, he would have none of that either. He did not wish to learn that women's talk, not he. And when one of the teachers advanced on him with a book and an ink horn, and waved them before him in a mild, persuasive way, much as a church warden invitingly shakes the offertory bag under the nose of a rich but niggardly parishioner. He sprang up with a fierce oath and flashed in Kosikas before the eyes of our learned friend. And there was an end of the attempt to teach him Zuvendi. Thus we spent our mornings in useful occupation which grew more and more interesting as we proceeded, and the afternoons were given up to recreation. Sometimes we made trips, notably one to the gold mines, 
and another to the marble quarries, both of which I wished I had space and time to describe. And sometimes we went out hunting buck, with dogs trained for that purpose, and a very exciting sport it is, as the country is full of agricultural enclosures, and our horses were magnificent. This is not to be wondered at, seeing that the royal stables were at our command, in addition to which we had four splendid saddle horses, given to us by Nyleptha. Sometimes, again, we went hawking, a pastime that is in great favor among the Zuvendi, who generally fly their birds at a species of partridge, which is remarkable for the swiftness and strength of its flight. When attacked by the hawk, this bird appears to lose its head, and instead of seeking cover, flies high into the sky, thus offering wonderful sport. I have seen one of these partridges soar up almost out of sight when followed by the hawk. Still better sport is offered by a variety of solitary snipe as big as a small woodcock, which is plentiful in this country, and which is flown at with a very small, agile, and highly trained hawk with an almost red tail. The zigzagging of the great snipe and the lightning rapidity of the flight and movements of the red-tailed hawk make the pastime a delightful one. Another variety of the same amusement is the hunting of a very small species of antelope with trained eagles, and it certainly is a marvelous sight to see the great bird soar and soar till he is nothing but a black speck in the sunlight, and then suddenly come dashing down like a cannonball upon some cowering buck that is hidden in a patch of grass from everything but that piercing eye. Still finer is the spectacle when the eagle takes the buck running. On other days we would pay visits to the country seats at some of the great lord's beautiful fortified places, and the villages clustering beneath their walls. Here we saw vineyards and cornfields and well-kept park-like grounds, with such timber in them as filled me with delight, for I do love a good tree. There it stands, so strong and sturdy and yet so beautiful, a very type of the best sort of man. How proudly it lifts its bare head to the winter storms, and with what a full heart it rejoices when the spring has come again. How grand its voice is, too, when it talks with the wind. A thousand Aeolian harps cannot equal the beauty of the sighing of a great tree in leaf. All day it points to the sunshine, and all night to the stars, and thus passionless and yet full of life, it endures through the centuries, come storm, come shine, drawing its sustenance from the cool bosom of its mother earth. And as the slow years roll by, learning the great mysteries of growth and of decay, and so on and on through generations, outliving individuals, customs, dynasties, all save the landscape it adorns, and human nature, till the appointed day when the wind wins the long battle and rejoices over a reclaimed space, or decay puts the last stroke to his fungus-fingered work. Ah, one should always think twice before one cuts down a tree. In the evenings it was customary for Sir Henry, Good, and myself to dine, or rather sup, with their majesties. Not every night, indeed, but about three or four times a week, whenever they had not much company, or the affairs of state would allow of it. And I am bound to say that those little suppers were quite the most charming things of their sort that I ever had to do with. How true is the saying that the very highest in rank are always the most simple and kindly. It is from your half and half sort of people that you get pomposity and vulgarity. 
the difference between the two being very much what one sees every day in England, between the old out-at-elbows broken-down country family and the overbearing purse-proud people who come and take the place. I really think that Nyleptha's greatest charm is her sweet simplicity and her kindly, genuine interest even in little things. She is the simplest woman I ever knew, and where her passions are not involved, one of the sweetest. But she can look queenly enough when she likes, and be as fierce as any savage, too. For instance, Never shall I forget that scene when I, for the first time, was sure that she was really in love with Curtis. It came about in this way, all through Good's weakness for ladies' society. When we had been employed for some three months in learning Zuvendi, it struck Master Good that he was getting rather tired of the old gentleman who did us the honor to lead us in the way that we should go. So he proceeded, without saying a word to anybody else, to inform them that it was a peculiar fact, but that we could not make any real progress in the deeper intricacies of a foreign language unless we were taught by ladies. Young ladies, he was careful to explain. In his own country, he pointed out, it was habitual to choose the very best-looking and most charming girls who could be found to instruct any strangers who happened to come that way, etc. All of this the old gentleman swallowed open-mouthed. There was, they admitted, reason in what he said, since the contemplation of the beautiful, as their philosophy taught, induced a certain porosity of mind, similar to that produced upon the physical body by the healthful influences of sun and air. Consequently, it was probable that we might absorb the Zuvendi tongue a little faster, if suitable teachers could be found. Another thing was that, as the female sex was naturally loquacious, good practice would be gained in the viva voce department of our studies. To all of this, good gravely assented, and the learned gentleman departed, assuring him that their orders were to fall in with our wishes in every way, and that, if possible, our views should be met. Imagine, therefore, the surprise and disgust of myself, and I trust and believe Sir Henry, when, on entering the room where we were accustomed to carry on our studies the following morning, we found, instead of our usual venerable tutors, three of the best-looking young women whom my losis could produce, and that is saying a good deal, who blushed and smiled and curtsied, and gave us to understand that they were there to carry on our instruction. Then good, as we gazed at one another in bewilderment, thought fit to explain, saying that it had slipped his memory before, but the old gentleman had told him on the previous evening that it was absolutely necessary that our further education should be carried on by the other sex. I was overwhelmed and appealed to Sir Henry for advice in such a crisis. Well, he said, you see the ladies are here, ain't they? If we sent them away, don't you think it might hurt their feelings, eh? One doesn't like to be rough, you see. And they look regular blues, don't they, eh? By this time, Good had already begun his lessons with the handsomest of the three. And so, with a sigh, I yielded. That day everything went very well. The young ladies were certainly very clever, and they only smiled when we blundered. I never saw Good so attentive to his books before, and even Sir Henry appeared to tackle Zuvendi with a renewed zest. Ah, thought I, will it always be thus? 
Next day we were much more lively. Our work was pleasingly interspersed with questions about our native country, what the ladies were like there, etc., all of which we answered as best we could in Zuvendi, and I heard Good assuring his teacher that her loveliness was to the beauties of Europe as the sun to the moon, to which she replied with a little toss of the head that she was a plain teaching woman and nothing else and that it was not kind to deceive a poor girl so. Then we had a little singing that was really charming, so natural and unaffected. The Zuvendi love songs are most touching. On the third day we were all quite intimate. Good narrated some of his previous love affairs to his fair teacher, and so moved was she that her sighs mingled with his own. I discoursed with mine, a merry blue-eyed girl, upon Zuvendian art, and never saw that she was waiting for an opportunity to drop a specimen of the cockroach tribe down my back, whilst in the corner Sir Henry and his governess appeared, so far as I could judge, to be going through a lesson framed on the great educational principles laid down by Wackford Squeers, Esquire, though in a very modified or rather spiritualized form. The lady softly repeated the Zuvendi word for hand, and he took hers. Eyes, and he gazed deep into her brown orbs. Lips, and... But just at that moment my young lady dropped the cockroach down my back and ran away laughing. Now, if there is one thing I loathe more than another, it is cockroaches and moved quite beyond myself, and yet laughing at her impudence, I took up the cushion she had been sitting on and threw it after her. Imagine then my shame, my horror, and my distress when the door opened, and attended by two guards only, in walked Nilepsa. The cushion could not be recalled. It missed the girl and hit one of the guards on the head. But I instantly and ineffectually tried to look as though I had not thrown it. Good ceased his singing and began to murder Zuvendi at the top of his voice. And Sir Henry whistled and looked silly. As for the poor girls, they were utterly dumbfounded. And Nilepha she drew herself up till her frame seemed to tower even above that of the tall guards, and her face went first red, and then pale as death. Guards, she said in a quiet, choked voice, and pointing at the fair but unconscious disciple of Wackford Squeers, slay me that woman. The men hesitated as well they might. "'Will ye do my bidding?' she said again in the same voice. "'Or will ye not?' "'Then they advanced upon the girl with uplifted spears. "'By this time Sir Henry had recovered himself "'and saw that the comedy was likely to turn into a tragedy. "'Stand back!' he said in a voice of thunder, "'at the same time getting in front of the terrified girl. "'Shame on thee, Nilepha! Shame! Thou shalt not kill her. Doubtless thou hast good reason to try to protect her. Thou couldst hardly do less in honor, answered the infuriated queen. But she shall die. She shall die. And she stamped her little foot. It is well, he answered. Then will I die with her. I am thy servant, O queen. Do with me even as thou wilt. And he bowed towards her and fixed his clear eyes contemptuously on her face. I could wish to slay thee too, she answered, for thou dost make a mock of me. And then feeling that she was mastered, and I suppose not knowing what else to do, she burst into such a storm of tears and looked so royally lovely in her passionate distress that, old as I am, 
I must say I envied Curtis his task of supporting her. It was rather odd to see him holding her in his arms, considering what had just passed, a thought that seemed to occur to herself. For presently she wrenched herself free and went, leaving us all much disturbed. Presently, however, one of the guards returned with a message to the girls that they were, on pain of death, to leave the city and return to their homes in the country, and that no further harm would come to them. And accordingly they went, one of them remarking philosophically that it could not be helped, and that it was a satisfaction to know that they had taught us a little serviceable zuvendi. Mine was an exceedingly nice girl, and overlooking the cockroach, I made her a present of my favorite lucky sixpence with a hole in it when she went away. After that, our former masters resumed their course of instruction, needless to say, to my great relief. That night, when in fear and trembling we attended the royal supper table, we found that Nyleptha was laid up with a bad headache. That headache lasted for three whole days, but on the fourth she was present at supper as usual, and with the most gracious and sweet smile gave Sir Henry her hand to lead her to the table. No allusion was made to the little affair described above, beyond her saying, with a charming air of innocence, that when she came to see us at our studies the other day, she had been seized with a giddiness from which she had only now recovered. She supposed, she added with a touch of the humor that was common to her, that it was the sight of people working so hard which had affected her. In reply, Sir Henry said, dryly, that he had thought she did not look quite herself on that day, whereat she flashed one of those quick glances of hers at him, which, if he had the feelings of a man, must have gone through him like a knife, and the subject dropped entirely. Indeed, after supper was over, and I left the condescended to put us through an examination to see what we had learnt, and to express herself well satisfied with the results. Indeed, she proceeded to give us, especially Sir Henry, a lesson on her own account, and very interesting we found it. And all the while that we talked, or rather tried to talk, and laughed, Sereus would sit there in her carven ivory chair, and look at us, and read us all like a book, only from time to time saying a few words, and smiling that quick ominous smile of hers, which was more like a flash of summer lightning on a dark cloud than anything else. And as near to her as he dared would sit good, worshipping through his eyeglass, for he really was getting seriously devoted to this somber beauty, of whom, speaking personally, I felt terribly afraid. I watched her keenly, and soon I found out that for all her apparent impassibility, she was at heart bitterly jealous of Nyleptha. Another thing I found out, and the discovery filled me with dismay, and that was that she also was growing devoted to Sir Henry Curtis. Of course, I could not be sure. It is not easy to read so cold and haughty a woman, but I noticed one or two little things, and, as elephant hunters know, dried grass shows which way the wind has set. And so another three months passed over us, by which time we had all attained to a very considerable mastery of the Zuvendi language, which is an easy one to learn. And as time went on, we became great favorites with the people, and even with the courtiers, gaining an enormous reputation for cleverness, because, as I think I have said, Sir Henry was able to show them how to make glass, which was a national want, and also, by the help of a twenty-year almanac that we had with us, to predict various heavenly combinations, 
which were quite unsuspected by the native astronomers. We even succeeded in demonstrating the principle of the steam engine to a gathering of the learned men, who were filled with amazement, and several other things of the same sort we did. And so it came about that the people made up their minds that we must on no account be allowed to go out of the country, which indeed was an apparent impossibility even if we had wished it, and we were advanced to great honor and made officers to the bodyguards of the sister queens, while permanent quarters were signed to us in the palace, and our opinion was asked upon questions of national policy. But blue as the sky seemed, there was a cloud, and a big one, on the horizon. We had indeed heard no more of those confounded hippopotami, but it is not on that account to be supposed that our sacrilege was forgotten, or the enmity of the great and powerful priesthood headed by Agon appeased. On the contrary, it was burning the more fiercely, because it was necessarily suppressed, and what had perhaps begun in bigotry was ending in downright direct hatred born of jealousy. Hitherto the priests had been the wise men of the land, and were on this account, as well as from superstitious causes, looked on with peculiar veneration. But our arrival, with our outlandish wisdom and our strange inventions and hints of unimagined things, dealt a serious blow to this state of affairs, and among the educated Zuvendi, went far towards destroying the priestly prestige. A still worse affront to them, however, was the favor with which we were regarded, and the trust that was reposed in us. All these things tended to make us excessively obnoxious to the great sacerdotal clan, the most powerful because the most united faction in the kingdom. Another source of imminent danger to us was the rising envy of some of the great lords, headed by Nasta, whose antagonism to us had at best been but thinly veiled, and which now threatened to break out into open flame. Nasta had for some years been a candidate for an Ilepthus hand in marriage, and when we appeared on the scene, I fancy, from all I could gather, that though there were still many obstacles in his path, success was by no means out of his reach. But now all this had changed. The coy Nilepta smiled no more in his direction, and he was not slow to guess the cause. Infuriated and alarmed, he turned his attention to Soraeus, only to find that he might as well try to woo a mountainside. With a bitter jest or two about his fickleness, that door was closed on him forever. So Nasta bethought himself of the thirty thousand wild swordsmen who would pour down at his bidding through the northern mountain passes, and no doubt vowed to adorn the gates of Milosis with our heads. But first he determined, as I learned, to make one more attempt and to demand the hand of Nilepta in the open court after the formal annual ceremony of the signing of the laws that had been proclaimed by the queens during the year. Of this astounding fact Nilepta heard with simulated nonchalance, and with a little trembling of the voice herself informed us of it as we sat at supper on the night preceding the great ceremony of the law-giving. Sir Henry bit his lip, and do what he could to prevent it plainly showed his agitation. "'And what answer will the Queen be pleased to give the great Lord?' asked I in a jesting manner. "'Answer, Macumazahn, for we had elected to pass by our Zulu names in Zuvendis,' she said with a pretty shrug of her ivory shoulder. "'Nay, I know not.' What is a poor woman to do 
when the wooer has thirty thousand swords wherewith to urge his love. And from under her long lashes she glanced at Curtis. Just then we rose from the table to adjourn into another room. Quatermain, a word, quick, said Sir Henry to me. Listen, I have never spoken about it, but surely you have guessed. I love Nilepsa. What am I to do? Fortunately, I had more or less already taken the question into consideration, and was therefore able to give such answer as seemed the wisest to me. You must speak to Nilepsa tonight, I said. Now is your time, now or never. Listen, in the sitting chamber get near to her, and whisper to her to meet you at midnight by the Radimas statue at the end of the great hall. I will keep watch for you there. Now or never, Curtis. We passed on into the other room. Nilepha was sitting, her hands before her, and a sad, anxious look upon her lovely face. A little way off was Sirius talking to Good in her slow, measured tones. The time went on. In another quarter of an hour I knew that, according to their habit, the queens would retire. As yet, Sir Henry had had no chance of saying a word in private. Indeed, though we saw much of the royal sisters, it was by no means easy to see them alone. I racked my brains, and at last an idea came to me. Will the queen be pleased, I said, bowing low before Sirius, to sing to her servants? Our hearts are heavy this night. Sing to us, O lady of the night. Sirius's favorite name among the people. My songs, Macumazahn, are not such as to lighten the heavy heart. Yet will I sing if it pleases thee, she answered. And she rose and went a few paces to a table, whereon lay an instrument not unlike a zither, and struck a few wandering chords. Then suddenly, like the notes of some deep-throated bird, her rounded voice sang out in song, so wildly sweet, and yet with so eerie and sad a refrain that it made the very blood stand still. Up, up soared the golden notes that seemed to melt far away, and then to grow again and travel on, laden with all the sorrow of the world and all the despair of the lost. It was a marvelous song, but I had not time to listen to it properly. However, I got the words of it afterwards, and here is a translation of its burden, so far as it admits of being translated at all. Sirius's Song As a desolate bird that through darkness its lost way is winging, as a hand that is helplessly raised when death's sickle is swinging. So is life, I the life that lends passion and breath to my singing. As the nightingale's song that is full of a sweetness unspoken, as a spirit unbarring the gates of the skies for a token, so is love, I the love that shall fall when his pinion is broken. As the tramp of the legions when trumpets their challenge are sending. As the shout of the storm god when lightnings the black sky are rending. So is power, I the power that shall lie in the dust at its ending. So short is our life, yet with space for all things to forsake us, a bitter delusion, a dream from which naught can awake us, till death's dogging footsteps at morn or at eve shall o'ertake us. Refrain Oh, the world is fair at the dawning, 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 but the red sun sinks in blood, 
the red sun sinks in blood. I only wish that I could write down the music, too. Now, Curtis, now, I whispered when she began the second verse and turned my back. Nilepta, he said, for my nerves were so much on the stretch that I could hear every word, low as it was spoken, even through Sereus's divine notes. Nilepta, I must speak with thee this night. Upon my life, I must. Say me not nay. Oh, say me not nay. How can I speak with thee? She answered, looking fixedly before her. Queens are not like other people. I am surrounded and watched. Listen, Nilepta, thus. I will be before the statue of Radimas in the great hall at midnight. I have the countersign and can pass in. Macumazahn will be there to keep guard, and with him the Zulu. O oh, come, my queen, deny me not. It is not seemly, she murmured, and tomorrow. Just then the music began to die in the last wail of the refrain, and Sereus slowly turned her round. I will be there, said Nilepta hurriedly. On thy life, see that thou fail me not. Chapter 16 Before the Statue It was night, dead night, and the silence lay on the frowning city like a cloud. Secretly, as evildoers, Sir Henry Curtis, Umslopogas, and myself threaded our way through the passage towards a by-entrance to the great throne chamber. Once we were met by the fierce rattling challenge of the sentry. I gave the countersign, and the man grounded his spear and let us pass. Also we were officers of the Queen's bodyguard, and in that capacity had a right to come and go unquestioned. We gained the hall in safety. So empty and so still was it, that even when we had passed the sound of our footsteps yet echoed up the lofty walls, vibrating faintly, and still more faintly, against the carven roof, like ghosts of the footsteps of dead men, haunting the place that once they trod. It was an eerie spot, and it oppressed me. The moon was full, and through great pencils and patches of light through the high windowless openings in the walls that lay pure and beautiful upon the blackness of the marble floor, like white flowers on a coffin. One of these silver arrows fell upon the statue of the sleeping Rademas, and of the angel form bent over him, illuminating it, and a small circle round it, with a soft, clear light, reminding me of that with which Catholics illumine the altars of their cathedrals. Here by the statue we took our stand and waited. Sir Henry and I close together, Umslopogas some paces off in the darkness, so that I could only just make out his towering outline leaning on the outline of an axe. So long did we wait that I almost fell asleep, resting against the cold marble, but was suddenly aroused by hearing Curtis give a quick catching breath. Then from far away there came a little sound, as though the statues that lined the walls were whispering to each other some message of the ages. It was the faint sweep of a lady's dress. Nearer it grew, and nearer yet. We could see a figure steal from patch to patch of moonlight, and even hear the soft fall of sandal defeat. Another second, and I saw the black silhouette of the old Zulu raise its arm in mute salute, and Nilepta was before us. Oh, how beautiful she looked as she paused a moment 
just within the circle of the moonlight. Her hand was pressed upon her heart, and her white bosom heaved beneath it. Round her head a broidered scarf was loosely thrown, partially shadowing the perfect face, and thus rendering it even more lovely. For beauty, dependent as it is to a certain extent upon the imagination, is never so beautiful as when it is half hid. There she stood, radiant, but half doubting, stately, and yet so sweet. It was but a moment, but I then and there fell in love with her myself, and have remained so to this hour, for indeed she looked more like an angel out of heaven than a loving, passionate, mortal woman. Lo, we bowed before her, and then she spoke. I have come, she whispered, but it was at great risk. Ye know not how I am watched. The priests watch me. Sureus watches me with those great eyes of hers. My very guards are spies upon me. Nasta watches me too. Oh, let him be careful, and she stamped her foot. Let him be careful. I am a woman, and therefore hard to drive. I, and I am a queen, too, and can still avenge. Let him be careful, I say, lest in place of giving him my hand I take his head. And she ended the outburst with a little sob, and then smiled up at us bewitchingly and laughed. Thou didst bid me come hither, my lord, Inkibu. Curtis had taught her to call him so. Doubtless it is about business of the state, for I know that thou art ever full of great ideas and plans for my welfare and my people's. So even as a queen should I have come, though I greatly fear the dark alone. And again she laughed and gave him a glance from her gray eyes. At this point I thought it wise to move a little, since secrets of the state should not be made public property. But she would not let me go far, peremptorily stopping me within five yards or so, saying that she feared surprise. So it came to pass that, however unwillingly, I heard all that passed. Thou knowest, Nilepha, said Sir Henry, that it was for none of these things that I asked thee to meet me at this lonely place. Nilepha, waste not the time in pleasantry, but listen to me, for I love thee. As he said the words, I saw her face break up, as it were, and change. The coquetry went out of it, and in its place there shone a great light of love, which seemed to glorify it, and make it like that of the marble angel overhead. I could not help thinking that it must have been a touch of prophetic instinct which made the long-dead Radamas limb in the features of the angel of his inspiring vision so strange a likeness of his own descendant. Sir Henry also must have observed and been struck by the likeness, for catching the look upon Nilepha's face, he glanced quickly from it to the moonlit statue and then back again at his beloved. Thou sayest thou dost love me, she said in a low voice, and thy voice rings true, but how am I to know that thou dost speak the truth? Though, she went on with proud humility, and in the stately third person which is so largely used by the Zuvendi, I be as nothing in the eyes of my lord, and she curtsied towards him, who comes from among a wonderful people, to whom my people are but children. Yet here am I, a queen and a leader of men, and if I would go to battle, a hundred thousand spears shall sparkle in my train like stars glimmering down the path of the bent moon. And although my beauty be a little thing in the eyes of my lord, 
and she lifted her broidered skirt and curtsied again. Yet here among my own people am I held right fair, and ever since I was a woman the great lords of my kingdom have made quarrel concerning me, as though forsooth, she added with a flash of passion, I were a deer to be pulled down by the hungriest wolf, or a horse to be sold to the highest bidder. Let my lord pardon me if I weary my lord. But it hath pleased my lord to say that he loves me, Nyleptha, a queen of the Zuvendi. And therefore would I say that though my love and my hand be not much to my lord, yet to me they are all. Oh, she cried with a sudden and thrilling change of voice, and modifying her dignified mode of address. Oh, how can I know that thou lovest but me? How can I know that thou wilt not weary of me and seek thine own place again, leaving me desolate? Who is there to tell me but that thou lovest some other woman, some fair woman unknown to me, but who yet draws breath beneath this same moon that shines on me tonight? Tell me, how am I to know? And she clasped her hands and stretched them out towards him and looked appealingly into his face. Nyleptha, answered Sir Henry, adopting the Zuvendi way of speech, I have told thee that I love thee. How am I to tell thee how much I love thee? Is there a measure for love? Yet will I try. I say not that I have never looked upon another woman with favor. But this I say, that I love thee with all my life and with all my strength, that I love thee now and shall love thee till I grow cold in death, I, and as I believe beyond my death, and on and on forever. I say that thy voice is music to my ear, and thy touch is water to a thirsty land, that when thou art there the world is beautiful, and when I see thee not it is as though the light was dead. O oh, Nyleptha, I will never leave thee. Here and now for thy dear sake I will forget my people and my father's house. Yea, I renounce them all. By thy side will I live, Nyleptha and at thy side will I die." He paused and gazed at her earnestly, but she hung her head like a lily and never said a word. Look, he went on, pointing to the statue on which the moonlight played so brightly. Thou seest that angel woman who rests her hand upon the forehead of the sleeping man, and thou seest how at her touch his soul flames up and shines out through his flesh, even as a lamp at the touch of the fire. So it is with me and thee, Nyleptha. Thou hast awakened my soul and called it forth, and now, Nyleptha, it is not mine, not mine, but thine, and thine only. There is no more for me to say. In thy hands is my life. And he leaned back against the pedestal of the statue, looking very pale, and his eyes shining, but proud and handsome as a god. Slowly, slowly she raised her head and fixed her wonderful eyes, all alight with the greatness of her passion, full upon his face, as though to read his very soul. Then at last she spoke, low indeed, but clearly as a silver bell. Of a truth, weak woman that I am, I do believe thee. Ill will be the day for thee and for me also if it be my fate to learn that I have believed a lie. And now hearken to me, O man, who hath wandered here from far to steal my heart, and make me all thine own. I put my hand upon thy hand, thus, and thus I, who
whose lips have never kissed before, do kiss thee on the brow. And now by my hand, and by that first and holy kiss, I by my people's wheel, and by my throne, that like enough I shall lose for thee, by the name of my high house, by the sacred stone, and by the eternal majesty of the sun, I swear that for thee will I live and die, and I swear that I will love thee and thee only till death, I and beyond, if, as thou sayest, there be a beyond, and that thy will shall be my will, and thy ways my ways. O oh, see, see, my lord, Thou knowest not how humble is she who loves. I, who am a queen, I kneel before thee. Even at thy feet I do my homage. And the lovely impassioned creature flung herself down on her knees on the cold marble before him. And after that I really do not know, for I could stand it no longer, and cleared off to refresh myself with a little of old Umslopogaz's society, leaving them to settle it their own way, and a very long time they were about it. I found the old warrior leaning on Inkosikas, as usual, and surveying the scene in the patch of moonlight with a grim smile of amusement. Ah, Makumazan, he said, I suppose it is because I am getting old, but I don't think that I shall ever learn to understand the ways of you white people. Look there now, I pray thee, they are a pretty pair of doves. But what is all the fuss about, Macumazan? He wants a wife, and she wants a husband. Then why does he not pay his cows down? End note. Alluding to the Zulu custom. Alan Quatermain. Like a man, and have done with it. It would save a deal of trouble, and we should have had our night's sleep. But there they go, talk, 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 and kiss, 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 like mad things. Ugh. Some three-quarters of an hour afterwards, the pair of doves came strolling towards us, Curtis looking slightly silly, and Nilepta remarking calmly, that the moonlight made very pretty effects on the marble. Then, for she was in a most gracious mood, she took my hand and said that I was her lord's dear friend, and therefore most dear to her. Not a word for my own sake, you see. Next she lifted Umslopogaz's axe, and examined it curiously, saying significantly as she did so that he might soon have cause to use it in defense of her. After that she nodded prettily to us all, and casting a tender glance at her lover, glided off into the darkness like a beautiful vision. When we got back to our quarters, which we did without accident, Curtis asked me jocularly what I was thinking about. I am wondering, I answered, on what principle it is arranged that some people should find beautiful queens to fall in love with them, while others find nobody at all, or worse than nobody. And I am also wondering how many brave men's lives this night's work will cost. It was rather nasty of me, perhaps, but somehow all the feelings do not evaporate with age, and I could not help being a little jealous of my old friend's luck. Vanity, my sons, vanity of vanities. On the following morning, Good was informed of the happy occurrence and positively rippled with smiles that, originating somewhere about the mouth, slowly traveled up his face like the rings in a duck pond till they flowed over the brim of his eyeglass and went where sweet smiles go. The fact of the matter, however, was that not only was Good rejoiced about the thing on its own merits, but also for personal reasons. He adored Sirius quite as earnestly as Sir Henry adored Nilepsa, 
and his adoration had not altogether prospered. Indeed, it had seemed to him, and to me also, that the dark Cleopatra-like queen favored Curtis in her own curious, inscrutable way much more than good. Therefore, it was a relief to him to learn that his unconscious rival was permanently and satisfactorily attached in another direction. His face fell a little, however, when he was told that the whole thing was to be kept as secret as the dead, above all from Sirius for the present, inasmuch as the political convulsion which would follow such an announcement at the moment would be altogether too great to face, and would very possibly, if prematurely made, shake Nyleptha from her throne. That morning we again attended in the throne hall, and I could not help smiling to myself when I compared the visit to our last, and reflecting that, if walls could speak, they would have strange tales to tell. What actresses women are! There, high upon her golden throne, draped in her blazoned calf or robe of state, set the fair Nyleptha, and when Sir Henry came in a little late, dressed in the full uniform of an officer of her guard, and humbly bent himself before her, she merely acknowledged his salute with a careless nod, and turned her head coldly aside. It was a very large court, for not only did the signing of the laws attract many outside of those whose duty it was to attend, but also the rumor that Nasta was going to publicly ask the hand of Nyleptha in marriage had gone abroad, with the result that the great hall was crowded to its utmost capacity. There were our friends the priests in force, headed by Agon, who regarded us with a vindictive eye, and the most imposing band they were, with their long white embroidered robes, girt with a golden chain, from which hung the fish-like scales. There, too, were a number of the lords, each with a band of brilliantly attired attendants, and prominent among them was Nasta, stroking his black beard meditatively and looking unusually pleasant. It was a splendid and impressive sight, especially when the officer after having read out each law, handed them to the queens to sign, whereon the trumpets blared out, and the queen's guard grounded their spears with a crash in salute. This reading and signing of the laws took a long time, but at length it came to an end, the last one reciting that, whereas distinguished strangers, etc., and proceeding to confer on the three of us the rank of lords, together with certain military commands and large estates bestowed by the queen. When it was read, the trumpets blared and the spears clashed down as usual, but I saw some of the lords turn and whisper to each other, while Nasta ground his teeth. They did not like the favor that was shown to us, which, under all the circumstances, was not perhaps unnatural. Then there came a pause, and Nasta stepped forward, and bowing humbly, though with no humility in his eye, craved a boon at the hands of the Queen Nyleptha. Nyleptha turned a little pale, but bowed graciously, and prayed the well-beloved Lord to speak on, whereon in a few straightforward soldier-like words he asked her hand in marriage. Then, before she could find words to answer, the high priest Agon took up the tale, and in a speech of real eloquence and power pointed out the many advantages of the proposed alliance, how it would consolidate the kingdom, for Nasta's dominions, of which he was virtually king, were to Zuvendis much what Scotland used to be to England. How it would gratify the wild mountaineers and be popular among the soldiery 
for Nasta was a famous general, how it would set her dynasty firmly on the throne, and would gain the blessing and approval of the son, that is, of the office of the high priest, and so on. Many of his arguments were undoubtedly valid, and there was, looking at it from a political point of view, everything to be said for the marriage. But unfortunately, it is difficult to play the game of politics with the persons of young and lovely queens as though they were ivory effigies of themselves on a chessboard. And I left this face while Agon spouted away was a perfect study. She smiled indeed, but beneath the smile it set like a stone, and her eyes began to flash ominously. At last he stopped, and she prepared herself to answer. Before she did so, however, Sereus leant towards her and said in a voice sufficiently loud for me to catch what she said, Bethink thee well, my sister, ere thou dost speak, for methinks that our thrones may hang upon thy words. Nilephtha made no answer, and with a shrug and a smile Sereus leant back again and listened. Of a truth a great honor has been done to me, she said, that my poor hand should not only have been asked in marriage, but that Agon here should be so swift to pronounce the blessing of the son upon my union. Methinks that in another minute he would have wed us fast, ere the bride had said her say. Nasta, I thank thee, and I will bethink me of thy words. But now as yet I have no mind for marriage. That is a cup of which none know the taste until they begin to drink it. Again I thank thee, Nasta. And she made as though she would rise. The great lord's face turned almost as black as his beard with fury, for he knew that the words amounted to a final refusal of his suit. "'Thanks be to the queen for her gracious words,' he said, restraining himself with difficulty and looking anything but grateful. "'My heart shall surely treasure them. And now I crave another boon, namely the royal leave, to withdraw myself to my own poor cities in the north, till such time as the queen shall say my suit, nay or yea. Mayhap, he added with a sneer, the queen will be pleased to visit me there, and to bring with her these stranger lords. And he scowled darkly towards us. It is but a poor country, and a rough but we are a hardy race of mountaineers, and there shall be gathered thirty thousand swordsmen to shout a welcome to her. This speech, which was almost a declaration of rebellion, was received in complete silence, but Nilephtha flushed up and answered it with spirit. Oh, surely, Nasta, I will come, and the strange lords in my train. And for every man of thy mountaineers who calls thee prince, will I bring two from the lowlands who call me queen, and we will see which is the staunchest breed. Till then, farewell. The trumpets blared out, the queens rose, and the great assembly broke up in murmuring confusion, and for myself I went home with a heavy heart, foreseeing civil war. After this, there was quiet for a few weeks. Curtis and the Queen did not often meet, and exercised the utmost caution not to allow the true relation in which they stood to each other to leak out. But do what they would, rumors as hard to trace as a buzzing fly in a dark room, and yet quite as audible, began to hum round and round and at last to settle on her throne. Chapter 17 The Storm Breaks And now it was that the trouble 
which at first had been but a cloud as large as a man's hand, began to loom very black and big upon our horizon, namely, Sorais's preference for Sir Henry. I saw the storm drawing nearer and nearer, and so, poor fellow, did he. The affection of so lovely and highly placed a woman was not a thing that could, in a general way, be considered a calamity by any man, but, situated as Curtis was, it was a grievous burden to bear. To begin with, Nyleptha, though altogether charming, was, it must be admitted, of a rather jealous disposition, and was sometimes apt to visit on her lover's head her indignation at the marks of what Alphonse would have called the distinguished consideration with which her royal sister favored him. Then the enforced secrecy of his relation to Nyleptha prevented Curtis from taking some opportunity of putting a stop, or trying to put a stop, to this false condition of affairs by telling Sorais, in a casual but confidential way, that he was going to marry her sister. A third sting in Sir Henry's honey was that he knew that Good was honestly and sincerely attached to the ominous-looking but most attractive lady of the night. Indeed, poor Bougouin was wasting himself to a shadow of his fat and jolly self about her, his face getting so thin that his eyeglass would scarcely stick in it, while she, with a sort of careless coquetry, just gave him encouragement enough to keep him going, thinking, no doubt, that he might be useful as a stalking horse. I tried to give him a hint, in as delicate a way as I could, but he flew into a huff and would not listen to me. So I was determined to let ill along for fear of making it worse. Poor Good! He really was very ludicrous in his distress and went in for all sorts of absurdities under the belief that he was advancing his suit. One of them was the writing, with the assistance of one of the grave and revered seniors who instructed us, and who, whatever may have been the measure of his erudition, did not understand how to scan a line, of a most interminable Zuvendi love song, of which the continually recurring refrain was something about, I will kiss thee, oh yes, I will kiss thee. Now among the Zuvendi, it is a common and most harmless thing for young men to serenade ladies at night, as I believe they do in the southern countries of Europe, and sing all sorts of nonsensical songs to them. The young man may or may not be serious, but no offense is meant and none is taken, even by ladies of the highest rank, who accept the whole thing as an English girl would a gracefully turned compliment. Availing himself of this custom, good bethought him that would serenade Sir Reyes, whose private apartments, together with those of her maidens, were exactly opposite our own, on the further side of a narrow courtyard which divided one section of the great palace from another. Accordingly, having armed himself with a native zither, on which, being an adept with the light guitar, he had easily learned to strum, he proceeded at midnight, the fashionable hour for this sort of caterwauling, to make night hideous with his amorous yells. I was fast asleep when they began, but they soon woke me up, for Good possesses a tremendous voice and has no notion of time and I ran to my window place to see what was the matter. And there, standing in the full moonlight in the courtyard, I perceived Good, adorned with an enormous ostrich feather headdress and a flowing silken cloak, which is the right thing to wear upon these occasions, and shouting out the abominable song which he and the old gentleman had evolved to a jerky, jingling accompaniment. From the direction of the quarters of the maids of honor 
came a succession of faint sniggerings, but the apartments of Sorais herself, whom I devoutly pitied if she happened to be there, were silent as the grave. There was absolutely no end to that awful song, with its eternal I will kiss thee, and at last neither I nor Sir Henry, whom I had summoned to enjoy the sight, could stand it any longer. So remembering the dear old story, I put my head to the window opening and shouted, For heaven's sake, good, don't go on talking about it, but kiss her and let's all go to sleep. That choked him off, and we had no more serenading. The whole thing formed a laughable incident in a tragic business. How deeply thankful we ought to be that even the most serious matters have generally a silver lining about them in the shape of a joke, if only people could see it. The sense of humor is a very valuable possession in life and ought to be cultivated in the board schools, especially in Scotland. Well, the more Sir Henry held off, the more Sirius came on, as is not uncommon in such cases till the last things got very queer indeed. Evidently she was, by some strange perversity of mind, quite blinded to the true state of the case, and I, for one, greatly dreaded the moment of her awakening. Sirius was a dangerous woman to be mixed up with, either with or without one's consent. At last the evil moment came, as I saw it must come. One fine day, good having gone out hawking, Sir Henry and I were sitting quietly talking over the situation, especially with reference to Sirius, when a court messenger arrived with a written note, which we with some difficulty deciphered, and which was to the effect that the Queen Sirius commanded the attendance of the Lord Incubu in her private apartments whether he would be conducted by the bearer. Oh, my word, groaned Sir Henry. Can't you go instead, old fellow? Not if I know it, I said with vigor. I had rather face a wounded elephant with a shotgun. Take care of your own business, my boy. If you will be so fascinating, you must take the consequences. I would not be in your place for an empire. You remind me of when I was going to be flogged at school, and the other boys came to console me, he said gloomily. What right has this queen to command my attendance, I should like to know? I won't go. But you must. You are one of her officers and bound to obey her, and she knows it. And after all, it will soon be over. That's just what they used to say, he said again. I only hope she won't put a knife into me. I believe that she is quite capable of it. And off he started very faint-heartedly, and no wonder. I sat and waited, and at the end of about forty-five minutes he returned, looking a good deal worse than when he went. Give me something to drink, he said hoarsely. I got him a cup of wine and asked what was the matter. What is the matter? Why, if ever there was trouble, there's trouble now. You know when I left you. Well, I was shown straight into Sirius's private chamber. And a wonderful place it is, and there she sat, quite alone, upon a silken couch at the end of the room, playing gently upon that zither of hers. I stood before her, and for a while she took no notice of me, but kept on playing and singing a little, and very sweet music it was. At last she looked up and smiled. So thou art come, she said. I thought perchance thou hadst gone about Queen Nilepha's business. Thou art ever on her business, and I doubt not a good servant and a true. To this I merely bowed, 
and said I was there to receive the Queen's word. Ah, yes, I would talk with thee, but be thou seated. It wearies me to look so high. And she made room for me beside her on the couch, placing herself with her back against the end, so as to have a view of my face. It is not meet, I said, that I should make myself equal with the Queen. I said be seated, was her answer, so I sat down, and she began to look at me with those dark eyes of hers. There she sat like an incarnate spirit of beauty, hardly talking at all, and when she did, very low, but all the while looking at me. There was a white flower in her black hair, and I tried to keep my eyes on it and count the petals, but it was of no use. At last, whether it was her gaze, or the perfume in her hair, or what I do not know, but I almost felt as though I was being mesmerized. At last she roused herself. Inkibu, she said, lovest thou power? I replied that I supposed all men loved power of one sort or another. Thou shalt have it, she said. Lovest thou wealth? I said I liked wealth for what it bought. Thou shalt have it, she said, and lovest thou beauty? To this I replied that I was very fond of statuary and architecture, or something silly of that sort, at which she frowned, and there was a pause. By this time my nerves were on such a stretch that I was shaking like a leaf. I knew that something awful was going to happen, but she held me under a kind of spell, and I could not help myself. Inkaboo, she said at length, wouldst thou be a king? Listen, wouldst thou be a king? Behold, stranger, I am minded to make thee king of all Zuvendis, I, and husband of Sereus of the night. Nay, peace. And hear me, to no man among my people had I thus opened out my secret heart, but thou art an outlander, and therefore I speak without shame, knowing all I have to offer, and how hard it had been thee to ask. See, a crown lies at thy feet, my lord Incubu, and with that fortune a woman whom some have wished to woo. Now mayest thou answer, O my chosen and soft shall thy words fall upon mine ears. O oh, Sereus, I said, I pray thee speak not thus. You see, I had not time to pick and choose my words, for this thing cannot be. I am betrothed to thy sister Nilepsa, O oh, Sereus, and I love her and her alone. Next moment it struck me that I had said an awful thing, and I looked up to see the results. When I spoke, Sereus's face was hidden in her hands, and as my words reached her, she slowly raised it, and I shrank back dismayed. It was ashy white, and her eyes were flaming. She rose to her feet and seemed to be choking, but the awful thing was that she was so quiet about it. Once she looked at a side table, on which lay a dagger, and from it to me, as though she thought of killing me, but she did not take it up. At last she spoke one word, and one only. Go! And I went, and glad enough I was to get out of it, and here I am. Give me another cup of wine, there's a good fellow, and tell me what is to be done. I shook my head, for the affair was indeed serious. As one of the poets says, Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, more especially if the woman is a queen and a Sereus. And indeed I feared the very worst, including imminent danger to ourselves. Nilepta had better be told of this at once, I said, 
and perhaps I had better tell her. She might receive your account with suspicion. Who is captain of the guard tonight? I went on. Good. Very well, then, there will be no chance of her being got at. Don't look surprised. I don't think that her sister would stick at that. I suppose one must tell good of what happened. Oh, I don't know, said Sir Henry. It would hurt his feelings, poor fellow. You see, he takes a lively personal interest in Sir Reyes. That's true, and after all, perhaps there is no need to tell him. He will find out the truth soon enough. Now you mark my words. Sereus will throw in her lot with Nasta, who is sulking up in the north there, and there will be such a war as has not been known in Zuvendis for centuries. Look there! And I pointed to two court messengers who were speeding away from the door of Sereus's private apartments. Now follow me! And I ran up a stairway into an outlook tower that rose from the roof of our quarters, taking the spyglass with me, and looked out over the palace wall. The first thing we saw was one of the messengers speeding towards the temple, bearing, without any doubt, the queen's word to the high priest Agon. But for the other I searched in vain. Presently, however, I spied a horseman riding furiously through the northern gate of the city, and in him I recognized the other messenger. Ah, I said, Sereus is a woman of spirit. She is acting at once, and will strike quick and hard. You have insulted her, my boy, and the blood will flow in rivers before the stain is washed away, and yours with it, if she can get hold of you. Well, I'm off to Nilepsa. Just you stop where you are, old fellow, and try to get your nerves straight again. You'll need them all, I can tell you, unless I have observed human nature in the rough for fifty years for nothing. And off I went accordingly. I gained audience of the Queen without trouble. She was expecting Curtis, and was not best pleased to see my mahogany-colored face instead. Is there aught wrong with my lord, Macumazahn, that he waits not upon me? Say, is he sick? I said that he was well enough, and then, without further ado, I plunged into my story and told it from beginning to end. Oh, what a rage she flew into! It was a sight to see her, she looked so lovely. How darest thou come to me with such a tale? she cried. It is a lie to say that my lord was making love to Sereus, my sister. Pardon me, O queen, I answered. I said that Sereus was making love to thy lord. Spin me no spider's webs of words. Is not the thing the same thing? The one giveth, the other taketh. But the gift passes. And what matters it which is the most guilty? Sereus! Oh, I hate her. Sereus is a queen and my sister. She had not stooped so low had he not shown the way. O oh, truly hath the poet said that man is like a snake, whom to touch is poison, and whom none can hold. The remark, O oh queen, is excellent, but methinks thou hast misread the poet. Nilepta, I went on, thou knowest well that thy words are empty foolishness, and that this is no time for folly. How darest thou, she broke in, stamping her foot. Hast my false lord sent thee to me to insult me also? Who art thou, stranger, that thou shouldest speak to me, the queen, after this sort? How darest thou? Yea, I dare. Listen, the moments which thou dost waste in idle anger may well cost thee thy crown and all of us our lives. Already Sereus' horsemen go forth and call to arms. In three days' time, Nasta will rouse himself and his fastnesses like a lion in the evening, and his growling will be heard throughout the north. The lady of the night, Sereus, hath a sweet voice 
and she will not sing in vain. Her banner will be borne from range to range and valley to valley, and warriors will spring up in its track like dust beneath the whirlwind. Half the army will echo her war cry, and in every town and hamlet of this wide land the priests will call out against the foreigner and will preach her cause as holy. I have spoken, O Queen. Nilepta was quite calm now. Her jealous anger had passed, and putting off the character of a lovely headstrong lady, with a rapidity and completeness that distinguished her, she put on that of a queen and a woman of business. The transformation was sudden but entire. Thy words are very wise, Macumazahn. Forgive me my folly. Ah, what a queen I should be if only I had no heart. To be heartless, that is to conquer all. Passion is like the lightning. It is beautiful, and it links the earth to heaven. But alas, it blinds. And thou thinkest that my sister Sereus would levy war upon me. So be it. She shall not prevail against me. I too have my friends and my retainers. There are many, I say, who will shout Nilepsa when my pennon runs up on peak and pinnacle, and the light of my beacon fires leaps tonight from crag to crag bearing the message of my war. I will break her strength and scatter her armies. Eternal night shall be the portion of Sereus of the night. Give me that parchment and the ink. So. Now summon the officer in the ante-room. He is a trusty man. I did as I was bid, and the man, a veteran and quiet-looking gentleman of the guard, named Kara, entered, bowing low. Take this parchment, said Nilepta. It is thy warrant, and guard every place of in and outgoing in the apartments of my sister Sereus, the lady of the night, and a queen of the Zuvendi. Let none come in, and none go out, or thy life shall pay the cost. The man looked startled, but he merely said, The queen's word be done, and departed. Then Nilepta sent a messenger to Sir Henry, and presently he arrived, looking uncommonly uncomfortable. I thought that another outburst was about to follow, but wonderful are the ways of woman. She said not a word about Sereus and his supposed inconstancy, greeting him with a friendly nod, and stating simply that she required his advice upon high matters. All the same, there was a look in her eye, and a sort of suppressed energy in her manner towards him that makes me think that she had not forgotten the affair, but was keeping it for a private occasion. Just after Curtis arrived, the officer returned, and reported that Sereus was gone. The bird had flown to the temple, stating that she was going, as was sometimes the custom among Zuvendi ladies of rank, to spend the night in meditation before the altar. We looked at each other significantly. The blow had fallen very soon. Then we set to work. Generals who could be trusted were summoned from their quarters, and as much of the state affairs as was thought desirable was told to each, strict injunctions being given to them to get all their available force together. The same was done with such of the more powerful lords as Nilepha knew she could rely on, several of whom left that very day for distant parts of the country to gather up their tribesmen and retainers. Sealed orders were dispatched to the rulers of far-off cities, and some twenty messengers were sent off before nightfall, with instructions to ride early and late till they reached the distant chiefs to whom their letters were addressed. Also many spies were set to work. All the afternoon and evening we labored, assisted by some confidential scribes, 
Nyleptha showing an energy and resource of mind that astonished me, and it was eight o'clock before we got back to our quarters. Here we heard from Alphonse, who was deeply aggrieved because our non-return had spoilt his dinner, for he had turned cook again now, that Good had come back from his hawking and gone on duty. As instructions had already been given to the officer of the outer guard to double the sentries at the gate, and as we had no reason to fear any immediate danger, we did not think it worth while to hunt him up and tell him anything of what had passed, which at best was, under the peculiar circumstances of the case, one of those tasks that one prefers to postpone. So after swallowing our food, we turned in to get some much-needed rest. Before we did so, however, it occurred to Curtis to tell old Umslopogas to keep a lookout in the neighborhood of Nyleptha's private apartments. Umslopogas was now well known about the place, and by the Queen's order allowed to pass whither he would by the guards, a permission of which he often availed himself by roaming about the palace during the still hours in the nocturnal fashion that he favored and which is by no means uncommon amongst black men generally. His presence in the corridors would not, therefore, be likely to excite remark. Without any comment, the Zulu took up his axe and departed, and we also departed to bed. I seemed to have been asleep but a few minutes when I was awakened by a peculiar sensation of uneasiness. I felt that somebody was in the room and looking at me, and instantly sat up, to see to my surprise that it was already dawn, and that there, standing at the foot of my couch, and looking peculiarly grim and gaunt in the grey light, was Umslopogas himself. "'How long hast thou been there?' I asked testily, for it is not pleasant to be aroused in such a fashion." Mayhap the half of an hour, Macumazon, I have word for thee. Speak on, I said, now wide enough awake. As I was bid, I went last night to the place of the White Queen, and hid myself behind a pillar in the second anteroom, beyond which is the sleeping place of the Queen. Bugwan, good, was in the first anteroom alone and outside the curtain of that room was a sentry. But I had a mind to see if I could pass in unseen, and I did, gliding behind them both. There I waited for many hours, when suddenly I perceived a dark figure coming secretly towards me. It was the figure of a woman, and in her hand she held a dagger. Behind that figure crept another unseen by the woman, it was Bougwan following in her tracks. His shoes were off, and for so fat a man he followed very well. The woman passed me, and the starlight shone upon her face. Who was it? I asked impatiently. The face was the face of the Lady of the Night, and of a truth she is well named. I waited, and Bougwan passed me also. Then I followed. So we went slowly and without a sound up the long chamber. First the woman, then Bougwan, and then I. And the woman saw not Bougwan, and Bougwan saw not me. At last the Lady of the Night came to the curtains that shut off the sleeping place of the White Queen, and put out her left hand to part them. She passed through, and so did Bougwan, and so did I. At the far end of the room is the bed of the queen, and on it she lay very fast asleep. I could hear her breathe, and see one white arm lying on the coverlid like a streak of snow on the dry grass. The lady of the night doubled herself thus, and with the long knife lifted crept towards the bed. So straight did she gaze thereat that she never thought to look behind her. 
when she was quite close, Bougwan touched her on the arm, and she caught her breath and turned, and I saw the knife flash and heard it strike. Well was it for Bougwan that he had the skin of iron on him, or he had been pierced. Then for the first time he saw who the woman was, and without a word he fell back astonished and unable to speak. She too was astonished and spoke not, but suddenly she laid her finger on her lips thus, and walked towards and through the curtain, and with her went Bougwan. So close did she pass to me that her dress touched me, and I was nay to slaying her as she went. In the first outer room she spoke to Bougwan in a whisper, and clasping her hands thus she pleaded with him, but what she said I know not. And so they passed on to the second outer room, she pleading, and he shaking his head, and saying, Nay, nay, nay. And it seemed to me that he was about to call the guard, when she stopped talking, and looked at him with great eyes, and I saw that he was bewitched by her beauty. Then she stretched out her hand, and he kissed it, whereon I gathered myself together to advance and take her, seeing that now had Bougwan become a woman, and no longer knew the good from the evil, when, behold, she was gone. Gone? I ejaculated. Aye, gone. And there stood Bougwan, staring at the wall like one asleep. And presently he went, too, and I waited a while, and came away also. Art thou sure, Umslopogaas? said I. "'that thou hadst not been a dreamer this night?' "'In reply he opened his left hand "'and produced about three inches of a blade "'of a dagger of the finest steel. "'If I be, Macumazahn, "'behold what the dream left with me. "'The knife broke upon Bougon's bosom, "'and as I passed I picked this up "'in the sleeping place of the White Queen.' "'Thank you for listening to our audiobooks. We do our best to regularly upload quality books with clear narrations. Please subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell icon so we can bring you more great books. Thank you very much and we hope you enjoyed listening to your audiobook.